It's been a long time coming, TG. Let's get right to it. Feel free to comment, otherwise the thread isn't going to last long enough for me to clear this entire goddamn thing. So, a brief recap from last time. I'm not going to go into full character bias or anything, just the basics. Bend, Wildcard, Lock, and Mathurfucking Dervish are in Titanga during the February festival season. Hunting down an Aztechnology shapper shifting adept gone rogue by the name of Rodrigo Alvarez some preliminary sleuthing revealed that, holy fuck, their boss is Schwarzkopf the Great Dragon, and they're pretty sure he is, in turn, working for Lothwir a really really important magical artifact of indiscriminate origins, left deliberately vague, stored in a sealed anti-magic carrying case was stolen by Mr. Alvarez on behalf of his bosses at Az Technology, but then he defected and fled to the tip, hiring a bunch of runner teams as a smokescreen Alvarez is selling the artifact to an unidentified buyer, likely Horizon, for a fuckload of money, which the team suspects is in the form of a recently stolen multimillion dollar or a chalcom shipment complicating all of this is the Jinsen Corporation, a shell company hiding a hardcore black ops team and a shitting of Amazonian mercs under the payroll of Sarug, who want to hijack the artifact and dick as technology over even harder in the process the team nearly got killed by a Jinsen hit squad in the middle of downtown Portland, losing an important contact in the process, and are now on the run. 8.40pm, the 23rd of February, 2074, Museum of Science and Industry, downtown Portland, Titan Guy Bolo checked his watch for the 15th time, he insisted on wearing the old thing. He didn't trust some fancy computer brick to tell him the time. Techy, the 250 pound or paced around the crates in the dim basement. His combat boots clacking on the hard floor as he checked the ammunition in his LMG. He glanced at Ice Queen the hacker, sitting atop one of the stacks of crates and kicking her feet absently as she fiddled with her comlink. The tall, skinny elf was dressed provocatively, despite her paramilitary gear. Her idea of a heavy combat loadout had always been more tank girl than the Punisher. She rattled around a pill bottle with her off hand and unceremoniously put it to her lips, swallowing a few as if it were a gulp of a beverage. Fuck, you gotta do that here keeps me focused. Boss, keeps you focused on the ceiling when you fucking odd is what? Ice Queen stuck her tongue out at Bolo. Whatever you say, dad, meld, the team's mage, spoke up, quietly, as always. It was easy to ignore the broad dwarf in the black hoodie, although today he wore a ballistic vest over the characteristic item of clothing, which was a fact that had kept Meld alive a long time in the running biz. Meld was leaning on an old school transport trolley, atop which sat a toddler sized, jet black ceramic box that he had assured the team was the right one. How's Johnson doing right? Um, lem check, said Ice Queen, scrambling for her comlink again. Barlow grunted. Helps you focus my ass ice queen rolled her eyes and brought up on our window for the rest of the team to see. Horizons extracting Johnson in about 45 seconds. Then we wait for his all clear to take the package to the roof. Then we get our million. Ain't that simple, growled Barlow. Not with Dervish in the building it isn't. Dervish is after Johnson. Cluck meld. Not us. That's Johnson's information. Johnson's information is compromised, we don't know that. Not for sure. What happened to the Nightingales could have been a bad coincidence. Grow the fuck up Ice Queen screamed, putting her hand up. Cool it a bear bulb flickered once as the orc and dwarf looked to their teammate. Johnson gave us the go ahead. We hand the package off to the German running team and then we're home free. Barlow blinked. Arts live. Then op is live. I hear something. The elevator dinged as it settled into the basement, surprising the three runners, who hastily scrambled for cover. Barlow dragged Ice Queen behind a stack of boxes while Meld stashed the trolley in an open crate and then dove behind an antique reel-to-reel -reel that was gathering dust. The doors opened, revealing four men in grey armor jumpsuits and ballot lovers. The merc in the lead had one of the museum's security guards at gunpoint, and was marching him into the basement. Where is the box speak quickly? The guard spoke waveringly, through the polarized glass of his helmet faceplate. It hasn't been moved. It's down here. The lead merc nodded back at his teammates and hefted his gun, and Raz Alpha with aftermarket attachments. Serrano Voki Pod Vero Artifato the merc in the back fingered a dream catcher and pointed at the crate holding the package. Sim, eat a cute narcakeser, 
Barlow glanced over at Ice Queen and whispered, as Tex Ice Queen shook her head and whispered back, Amazonians, as the Merc Mage peered into the crate, nodding, the lead Merc looked back at another teammate. Desconnect Su Biomonitor EM Segada, Atarolo Narcabasa, with a nod, the addressed Merc produced a comlink, tapped a few commands, and then pulled a Crusader machine pistol and planted a clattering burst in the back of the guard's neck. Brain and bone dribbled from the polarized faceplate as the guard crumpled onto the tile floor. Fucking hell. Hissed I squeam. Back door on the security system and jammed the elevator doors open. Commented Meld. Calmly. Over the team's tacnet. We'll hit them when they all clump up. Barlow nodded slowly. Roger. Mexa said the mercs beat a tactical retreat to the elevator. With the mage pulling the trolley. As the merc hacker pressed the door close button and nothing happened. The rest of the mercs instinctively glanced towards him. That was the opening that Meld and Barlow needed, as Meld planted a stun ball right in the middle of the elevator, and Barlow followed up by popping over his crate, setting his LMG at shoulder height, and then opening up on the stumbling figures within the elevator. The mercs cried out in pain and surprise as Barlow carved expert lines across their flailing bodies, taking care to avoid the trolley carrying the package. With the elevator reduced to a charnel house, Meld and Ice Queen advanced to either side of the elevator and surveyed the scene, while Meld drew his combat knife and dispassionately checked the bodies for life. Ice Queen gingerly stepped over one of the corpses and investigated the clean holes planted in the back wall of the elevator. No machinery hit. Elevator should be good, Barlow tramped into the elevator, leveling his gun at the hip to face the doors. What are we waiting for, then just your go ahead. Chief, said Ice Queen, as she willed the doors closed, putting her hand on the interior railing to keep from stumbling over the bodies as they shifted with the elevator's ascent. As the elevator lurched to life, Meld glanced at the ceiling. Don't look now, but there's another one of those micro cameras up in the corner, yeah, they're slaved to this Hyundai out in the parking lot, commented Ice Queen. Go ahead and fry it, Meld nodded succinctly and glared at the tiny lens which crackled and popped with heat. As the elevator began slowing down on the top floor, Barlow adjusted his LMG on its gyro mount and prepared to fire. The elevator doors opened onto the planetarium, in the middle of a show. The moons of Jupiter hovered above the spherical room as the team cautiously advanced into the room, their boots clinking on the catwalk-esque floor. The show's motion activated, commented Ice Queen. Doesn't start until people enter the room. Someone was here before us. Probably the Amazonians, commented Barlow. Stay frosty. As the team advanced toward the center of the room, they found a body slumped against the base of the central projector. The infiltrator's tactical cloak sputtered and turned on and off, interacting poorly with the blood dripping from a few well-placed gunshot wounds to the sternum. Barlow placed his hand on the transparent hood and pulled it back, revealing a photogenic blonde woman. One of horizons. She's fresh. The Amazonians definitely came through here, doesn't mean that there isn't anyone else, retorted Meld, pushing the trolley towards the roof access stairs. Barlow wordlessly backed toward the stairs, moving to cover his team, as the team advanced up the stairs, with Ice Queen helping Meld to lift the trolley, Barlow shifted ahead in the thin concrete passage to deliberately block access to the package if they were double crossed. He knocked twice on the roof access stairs, which were unlocked and opened after a short pause by a broad, Slavic looking orc with a shaved head and obvious sibiris, decked out in a suit of black ceramic tactical armor. Barlow surveyed the situation. Debris fluttered across the roof, spurred by the still spinning dual counter rotors of a jet black transport chopper, retrofitted with twin miniguns that gleamed in the electric light of the Portland sprawl. Six men in matching black combat armor were set up at firing positions across the roof. Four in each corner, one guarding the helicopter, whom Mel swiftly marked on the tacnet as an adept, and the one holding the open door. The seventh man, who didn't match the mold, was a harsh-featured German human in urban camo paramilitary fatigues who jogged up to Barlow. A series of hermetic foci dangled from his bandolier as he slowed his pace. Surveying the package behind Barlow as if the orc wasn't there. The air around him crackled with energy. Herman Dare article IST got in for and see and Serabich of a lot of new languages today, grumbled Barlow, as he approached the mage. Are you Quake Yak? That is me, said the German, 
nodding. Give us the package. Like arranged. Hold up. I need to make sure that my team doesn't get double crossed. Said Barlow. Holding a hand up. I'm going to have my team take up firing positions as I do the handoff from the cover of the stairway. The Germans face harden. They don't have time for this. Hand it over. I know enough to know we're in over our heads. If you start shooting, the deal's off. Quake seethed as Barlow retreated into the tight stairwell. As Meld lifted the package to his grasp, a voice shouted from the darkness of the planetarium. Nobody move the hand off is off Barlow sighted the goggle flare off a lithe elf in a tactical cloak taking cover amidst the seats in the planetarium. His finger hovered over the trigger, although the next call stayed his hand. If anyone so much as raises their gun, I'll blow you all to kingdom come quake shouted over Barlow's shoulder. It's a bluff I had my men sweep the roof and they didn't find anything the elf decloaked and held a hand over his cover, clearly gripping a detonator. He shouted back, there's a comp C pipe bomb under the rooftop staircase. Have your hacker check it, Ice Queen glanced under the stairs, paled, and looked back up at Barlow and Quake, as Meld kept his hands up. There's a box down there, wrapped up in ribbons like a Christmas gift. Quake shouted, enraged. That's because it's a bluff Meld spoke up, quietly, he is a buddhist mystic adept, I read this guy's dossier, Bolo, he's a pacifist, you're fucking sure about that Quake growled, quietly enough for the elf to not hear, I have the same information, he's on Devish's team, Bolo squeezed the trigger of his LMG, tearing apart the chairs that Bend was using for cover and sending him sprawling to the ground, spattering the display behind him with gore, Bolo barked, Let's move as Barlow tossed the black box to Quake, who caught it awkwardly. Ice Queen screamed. Boss this is a real bomb as the trade phantasm melted away. The real bend reappeared behind the planetarium's central projector, whimpering through open tears as he clutched the detonator to his heart. Meld's throat caught in his chest as he broke his cool facade to yell. Whoa hey you're a pacifist remember? You're a pacifist hey Merry Christmas. What Barlow? Ice Queen. And Meld were reduced to particulate matter as the roof erupted like a volcano, spewing ash, twisted metal, and concrete into the night sky. In the distance, sirens sounded as the Titerror alert system blared to life. 3.30 PM, the 29th of January, 2074, Lewis and Clark Highway, Titangar Dervish cradled his once shattered shoulder which had managed to piece itself back together through the select combination of his platelet factories and locks magic. Nevertheless, he had lost a lot of blood, and he felt nauseous and lightheaded as he reclined in what remained of the shotgun seat of the super getaway high and die. During the healing process, he had kept dropping the passenger side door, and so the team had simply had him force it into the hinges, crushing it into place. As the river flowed to the south of the highway in dissonant serenity, Wildcard asked, darkly, so we're all in agreement, then Locke nodded. See, Ben paused for a moment, but then nodded as well, yeah, let's do it, Dervish weakly grunted an affirmation. A stock phone ring sound effect played as Wildcard called up Schwarzkopf, Mr. Johnson speaking, Johnson, gulped Locke, we're here to renegotiate, now, said Schwarzkopf. Calmly, I don't see why you would so unprofessionally we know about Sirurg, Mr. Johnson, we know he's after the item, we wouldn't run against you for 200,000, and we sure as hell won't run against him for 200,000, I see, Schwarzkopf sounded disappointed, I believe that we had a miscommunication as to the difficulty of this mission, and I'm sorry that you weren't up to the task, that's not quite the case, Mr. Johnson, said Locke, tentatively, we merely believe that if we're to break one of the core rules of our profession, to the extent that our job security in the field will be jeopardized forthwith, you would like a reward more in keeping with a retirement fund than merely paying off existing debts, I'm glad that you understand, Mr. Johnson, yes, I believe that I do, I'm going to put you on hold now, there was a long, tense silence, the entire team was well aware that, given Lofwa's reputation, they were running the chance of having the kill order dropped on them then and there, and everyone knew it. Mr. Ramirez are you still there yes? Mr. Johnson, I've talked to my old friend about expanding the resources assigned to this operation. Locke didn't have the balls to ask Schwarzkopf to continue. 
There was another pause. He's agreed to 2 million per head, plus a bonus. There was an audible whoosh as everyone in the car exhaled. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. And please extend our thanks to your old friend. Could you please clarify the nature of the bonus in fact, said Schwartzkopf. That is the next order of business. You see, should this mission be a success, as compensation for your imminent retirement, my old friend has offered each of you one wish, within his ability to grant, to be redeemed after the mission's success, Dervish gawked. Like, like a genie, there was a loud clang as Ben slapped him upside the head. Yes, Dervish. Like a genie. If you have any suggestions now, it would help for me to arrange the necessary factors. A single beaded tear ran across Wildcard's unmasked neck, a brief souvenir of his prior certainty that he would be eaten. Are you serious, Mr. Johnson quite? Let's start with you, Mr. Ramirez. Since I suspect that yours is the most obvious, Locke nearly blurted out, I want the bounty called off. And I want a stable job somewhere that I never have to see an as technology billboard again. Yes, that's approximately what I expected. Mr. Cadbury Wildcard said, I want a pointless government position somewhere that I can use as a cover for a criminal fixer network, filling in the talent gaps between syndicate contractors. I want to run heists from Manila to Tokyo with impunity and be untouchable for it. Schwarzkopf paused. So you don't want out of the criminal life I want further in, said Wildcard. Very well. Mr. Colby I want back into espionage, and the authority to pick my own jobs in the Tehirachi. A scribbling noise suggested that Schwarzkopf was writing the wishes down on a piece of physical paper. And you, Dervish Dervish took a moment to think about it. I wanna be a company man. Not some stooge, somebody rich and kickass, like Alvarez. And I wanna meet my real family, I guess, with your talents. I'm sure that it can be arranged, said Schwarzkopf. Very well. Gentlemen, I hope that you are pleased with the renegotiation, and expect to hear a report of your success very soon. Yes, Mr. Johnson, said Locke, trembling, as Schwarzkopf hung up. The team had a few minutes of driving, under the speed limit, for the first time in Wildcard's criminal career. To recollect themselves. A lone vanity speedboat buzzed down the Columbia River to the team's right, passing them as two yuppie elves briefly regarded the car and then went back to their business. An our bulletin hovered by the otherwise unspoiled wilderness to the left, alerting onlookers that deer had been spotted in the area and might try to cross the highway. An 18 wheeler passed by in the opposite direction, honking twice at a bank in the road. We need to go back, gulped Wildcard. I promised Belfast I'd help him with a bank robbery. Yeah, said Ben, glumly. It was the payment for Kara to move our stuff across the border. I'm going to consider any job to be a welcome distraction from. Lock trailed off, you know. This, Dervish grunted an affirmation. Wildcard began decelerating to look for an opportunity to make a U-turn, which unfortunately had the added effect of allowing their pursuer its opportunity to plow through the tree line. Heralded by the immediate flight of every bird roosting within a kilometer, a seven-foot-tall creature launched over the highway, adjusted in midair with a burst of its thrusters, flipped twice, and landed on the engine block feet first with a horrible screech and earth-shaking crunch. The rear of the car jumped with the sheer force of the impact as a humanoid figure that was almost entirely mechanical reared up and deployed a machete out of one arm and a rotary machine gun out of the other, the jaundiced. Stigmatized upper half of an orcish head lolled from atop a buzzing electronic spine, its mechanical lower jaw gnashing. Give me Felix Ramirez. As Locke just screamed aloud and flailed for his LMG, Dervish extended his cyber blades and instinctively stood up, his shoulders plowing through the flimsy remains of the car's roof. The cyber zombie's machine gun spun to life and began firing wildly as Dervish grabbed it by the arm and forced it to pepper the river with shots. The cyber zombie stared at Dervish, its unadorned red cyber eyes rolling across his features. A flash of recognition scrunched up its features. Will 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 eeo, for fucking what the cyber zombie hooked with its machete arm, slamming the blade deep into Dervish's head but not breaching his highly reinforced skull. Nevertheless, Dervish catapulted off of the veering car, slamming into the ground and rolling as he trailed blood from his brow. 
the cyber zombie ray focused its attention on the vehicle and was promptly knocked off itself as Ben nailed its right in the sternum with a burst of fire from Dervish's shotgun. As the car swerved to a stop on the shoulder, the cyber zombie did a backflip, settled into a low hover over the highway, and then began pouring rounds into the left side of the car, blasting off the driver's side door and prompting Ben, Lock, and Wildcard to take cover behind the hull of the vehicle. Dervish stumbled to his feet 50 meters away, wiping a prodigious amount of blood from his face. Why do cyber zombies keep calling me that, do not in an interfere will I e the fugitive hand over the fugitive lock slammed his bipart down on the wrecked hood of the Hyundai and proceeded to work his way through a drum of apps in response, continuing to scream at the top of his lungs, as Wildcard and Ben scattered, flinching at the impacts as though it was reacting to being pelted with softballs, the thing slowly turned to face the car again, its jaw lolled open, snake like, as it produced a rocket propelled grenade launcher from its upper chest and folded its inhuman head down to aim it. The orcish face tore and bled further. Suddenly, a tear attack chopper appeared in the air. It literally appeared, in the sense that Bend had hit the radius of the zombie's mana dampening field and popped off a tread phantasm. The fake pilot announced, we have you surrounded. Stand down, with an awful snap. The cyber zombie's head neck rocket launcher spun 180 degrees and launched the grenade at the chopper, whereupon it proceeded to sail right through and fly into the afternoon sky. The zombie stumbled on its feet as Wildcard sprinted up to it with a fresh drum full of X explosive and began hammering away at its upper body at point blank range, tearing its gun arm clean off with a spray of synthetic blood replacement. Nonplussed, it turned to face him, writhing as it danced with the explosive bullets and slowly began to step forward like a swimmer stepping into a wave. Its machete arm gleamed. Thatha that was a dirty trick dirty trick dirty trick that you first wild card screamed, panicking, anytime. Dervish, with a roar, Dervish slammed bodily into the cyber zombie, carrying his elbow blades through its shoulders. Abandoning all pretense of restraint, he crashed his bladed fists again and again into the zombie's face, not stopping until the top half of its head was gone. As its remaining arm and legs continued to flail, he tore each of them off and proceeded to hammer away at its unprotected torso, not stopping until every semblance of movement had ceased. When all was said and done, the asphalt was coated with nuts, bolts, strips of flesh, and surrogate blood. As the party stood up to examine their kill, a single family minivan filled with terrified looking elves pulled to a stop at the scene of the carnage. Wildcard made a circular as you would gesture with his forefinger, causing them to speed off towards Portland. This is the second time a cyber zombie has called me Willie, noted Dervish, as he began dragging the zombie's legs to the side of the river. Shit's getting weird, maybe you're just, like, the cyber zombie whisperer, said Ben, kneeling over the decapitated skull. Whoa, hey, Wildcard raised his gun instinctively at the whoa. Hey as Dervish tossed the legs into the water and doubled back for the arms. Bend raised the head by its scalp. Doesn't this look like Dervish it's the top half of an orc head with Sibiris, said Dervish, deadpan, as he flopped a Sibir arm over each shoulder. Not exactly difficult, no, I'm serious, said Ben, looking the head in its still twitching eyes. Dervish, open your mouth, Dervish paused in the middle of a hammer toss. The arms flopped into the river with a plunk. What? Open your mouth. Why? Do what the man says. Dervish, said Wildcard, in the middle of, very gingerly, dragging the torso, but only after running a brief scan for explosives. With an ahwa, Dervish opened his mouth, and Ben crouched down to hold up the cyber zombie head next to his. Holy fuck, this guy's got your teeth. Like, exactly. Dervish instinctively stepped away from the head. You're killing me. Lock said Wildcard, gesturing for the team's mage. Can you hit this thing with a read thoughts pewter mari I'm not even touching it Locke shouted back, as he loaded his LMG back into the trunk. Cyber zombies are filled with more bad mojo than a Tawana talismanga, Wildcard shrugged. Can't you just read its thoughts a little I'm feared I don't know how magic works well enough. Well, maybe you could lean over and give its neck stump a good lick, said Locke. Bitter, but only just a little. We're spinning our wheels here, Locke, grunted Dervish. Fine, said Locke, with a melodramatic sigh, although he whispered Pendagus, 
as he took the twitching head from Ben. With a flare of magic and a deeply violated sensation, Locke dropped the head on the road and jerked backwards. Ben hit him with a quicker sensing and, satisfied that nothing had leaked in, asked, What did you see? Rook nada mucho, said Locke, kneading his temples, a bunch of tanks. Orc bodies with silverware, recognize the tech. As technology homegrown warrior program, they put us in similar tanks to install our wear. Standard numbering system for infantry removal. 3220 I'm. 3221 I'm. 3222 I'm. Hard to make out because this guy typically saw them upside down. From the perspective of an operating table, Dervish blinked. Not that it was evident behind his retractable cyber blade covers. What about 3177 I'm bent made a confused expression as Locke clarified. Not that I saw. What were you thinking? Wildcard interjected. He was thinking that if you flip the Kalsen 3177 I'm upside down, it would look a hell of a lot like you were spelling Willy. Dervish snorted in agreement. After a short pause, Locke punted the head into the river, patted Dervish on the back, and turned to head back to the car. Welcome to us technology, amigo. We're our souls. 5.30 PM, the 29th of January, 2074. Hermiston, Titanga so, you said you were in. An accident a young elf with a crew cut wearing a wife beater and Capri shorts surveyed the bullet riddled mess that was Wildcard's car. Yes. The Hyundai Shin Hyung is one of the most common cars in the world. Are you saying that you don't have the replacement parts on hand to patch the hood, roof, and passenger side doors and the windshield, and the sunroof, standard wear and tear, noted wildcard, as Locke took a smoke break outside and Bend and Dervish leaned against the walls of the garage. You know, I go down to the shooting range on weekends, and these are 7.76 caliber bullets in the inside of your door here. That isn't a hunting caliber, double standard fee. Chuma, said Wildcard, with a sigh. Triple and I replace the armor plating you hid in the upholstery. Now yeah speaking my language. Friend, said Wildcard, get it done quick and you get a tip. The mechanic popped the trunk, got an eyeful of illegal automatic weaponry, and closed it again. Yes it. As the mechanic went to the front of the shop to flip his I'm sorry, we are closed sign. Lock filed back in, dispensed with his cigarette, and noted. So, Plan Dervish grunted, wait for the roo, as the mechanic filed back in and got to work on the car, Ben set up his white noise machine in the garage's office and wildcard sat on the edge of the desk. Plan is, we're going to help my bud with what we promised him, first off, it's a downtown bank, so we'll be hitting it like shadow runners do, quick and quiet. His muscle will be on hand if things go south, and regardless of how we perform, which will be well, mind. Kara will get our mil spec and high explosives cross the border. Dervish leaned forward as he pulled up a folding chair, handling his healing shoulder gingerly. His head wound had already solidified into a wicked scar, one of many. Alright, well what about the primary job Ben toyed with the settings on the white noise machine? I think you should play up the Holderman angle. We've got a strong hunch that the deal will be going down at the drone unveiling, and we already know that she's on the up and up. There's worse things you could be doing than sucking up to the museum security director. Locke nodded as he closed the office door. I agree. I'll handle the mage's conclave as well. Just in case. Since. Yes. We all know you're sticking it to a homeland security agent. Spat bend. For like the fifth time. Still a good idea. I'll give you. You know what's an angle I think we haven't played yet dervish grunted. And bend continued. The nightingales. Wildcard brought up a discography of the Nightingale's albums. What? Alvarez's ridiculous obvious red herring Los Angeles runner team bend clarified. That's the thing. You know how I used to run the cull free Vegas shadows well. That's just how runner culture works down there. Going by their above ground fame, I think it's safe to assume that they're highly competent in the shadows and getting well paid for their efforts. We should try to find out what Alvarez has them on. Wildcard nodded slowly as he sifted through the Nightingale's dossiers. Excellent idea. Once we have what we need we can knock them off to deny Alvarez that asset. 2. Ben Cringe. Dude. They're women. They're shadow runners. 
corrected Locke. They're fair game. Bend grumbled and sank into his folding chair. Dervish commented. What about Jinsen and as technology they're both out for our asses and each other's. 2. The less we fuck with Sirog and the Aziz until the big day, the better, said Locke. Resolute. I'm inclined to support Locky boy on this one, said Wildcard, bringing up their intel on Jinsen's sleeper teams. We want them to think we've been spooked, since they are both much bigger pieces on the game board. Better to let them whittle each other down and then sneak in under their noses. Although he didn't stop making grumbling noises, Bend nodded his agreement. Bank jobs on Friday, noted Wildcard, all in favor of sticking around in this pointless podunk till the heat blows over four hands shot up. Noon, the 2nd of February, 2074, Bank of the Tip, Sam Morrison Street, Portland, Titangano, honey, I think it's great that you got into the eco charity thing, I'm just a little worried about the student equity union's ties to Greenwa, is all, said Ben. The shadow runner formerly known as Special Agent Peter Colby. Before they mellow out, young liberals tend to flirt with radicalism and it's not good company. Believe me, I've been there, as Bend adjusted the micro charges placed on the seams of the data vault that held all the in-process cred sticks. Emily responded, you yeah, don't worry, Sean, my student politics phase is behind me. I just want to make sure that, like, I'm doing all I can for the environment, you know also, if I can totally show up Jennifer from the young technocrats, all the better, negativity breeds negativity, lectured Ben, as he finished with the charges and slapped a small black box onto one of the external servers, look, baby, I gotta go, I'm at the bank and they're about to call my number, okay, fine, said Emily, as the black box blazed to life and began siphoning cred into the hardened server van in the outside alley. Hey, did I tell you my application went through for that philanthropy work and Lagos Ben scowled as he switched to the other line briefly. Hey, wildcard, the boxes and the charges are in place. You're sure that we can't just make it out of this one without being detected no can do. My fears, chuckled the Scotsman on the other end of the line. Either we jam them and they know, or their hard room spider catches the increased data traffic. Still, keeping it silent for as long as possible, that we can do. I still think we should have hit the spider first. Growl Ben, would have had to go out early. Damned if you do, et fecking cetera. Keep your eye on the prize, Ben, and stop using your sub vehicles for personal calls. I can hear all that shite. Bend hastily switched lines again as he neared the thick grate that separated the server room from the bank floor. He had piggybacked on a large deposit a few hours ago in the form of a wombat and had been hiding in the server room since. Although with Locke, Dervish, and Belfast's crew walking through the front doors his prodigious subtlety would soon be for naught. That's great, Emily, but you know how I feel about Lagos. Look, I gotta go. I'll be fine. Sean. I love you. Ben got through I love you T when Dervish plowed headlong into the security spider's black box armored cubicle, pulled him bodily from his nexus, and slammed one of Wildcard's satlinks into the computer. Ben hastily hung up as the security doors slammed shut. Ladies and gentlemen, announced Belfast, his voice augmented by a loudspeaker voice modifier hybrid in his mask, this is a robbery. If everyone would please line up with their hands over their heads in an orderly fashion, we can relieve you of your cred sticks and be out in 10 minutes. There were a few muffled yells as Belfast's men plugged the startled guards with gel rounds from their SMGS, quickly moving to disarm the twitching bodies. Predictably, everyone put their hands over their heads. Everyone except one middle-aged Texan standing at the bank counter, sporting a whole new host of muscle augmentations and in the best shape of his life. His sibiris spun and focused on Dervish, narrowing with a whir over his bushy moustache as he sighted his adversary's American flag shemag. Dervish. Dervish released the unmoving spider from a sleeper hold and tried to identify what he was seeing. Holy fuck. It's hero cop guy, Captain Joseph Green. Freshly enlisted in Knight Errant last year because I felt I had lost control of my life, said the Texan. Emphasizing every word from loss to life as he shrugged his muscular arms and reached for his sidearm. Belfast's goons glanced to Dervish, who simply shook his head no and held a hand out. Really sorry to hear that, Joe, said Dervish. 
How's that working out for you real well? Actually, said Green, who noted the guns trained on his predator hand and didn't move to draw, despite his ever-narrowing brow, said they ain't ever seen an old man so motivated to fight crime. Course, they had to fill me up with augmentations. You know, make me competitive with the young bucks. Dervish stepped towards Green nonchalantly. You find that doesn't interfere with your personal life nor. The R&D monkeys over at Raz warned me that all these, watch your callum, prototypes might have side effects, but I ain't seen hide nor hair of them yet. Wife's pleased, too, and not just cause I got work again. We went on a second honeymoon to the tip, Dervish flexed his inverted cyber legs, rising and lowering on avian feet. The bystanders began slowly lowering themselves to the floor, not wanting to be in the line of fire if anyone started shooting. I can see that, Joe, so, I'm going to cut this little coincidence short. I'm imagining that you want to beat my face in more than anything right now. Green looked to the goons on either side. About right, and I'm invested in these boys robbing this bank with little to no collateral damage, so I really don't want to play the hostage card. Green nodded. I imagine you don't. Well, I think I got just the thing for that, courtesy of my buddy working the servers right now. Ain't that right? WC with that. The emergency shutter covering the front door lifted, grinding and creaking to the sounds of distant sirens. Dervish stepped outside of the bank and settled into a fighting stance. Well, done. Guess there's still honor in the world today, said Green, as he ran towards Dervish. Happy second honeymoon. Thanks, bud with that. Green activated his skimmers and boosted into a full body haymaker. Smashing dervish jaw first into a parked car and irrevocably destroying its driver's side wheel well. The security shutter slammed shut once more as Belfast's goons got to ferrying the ill-gotten loot out into the back alley and lock went to work melting through the security grate to allow Ben back into the lobby. Interesting company you keep, said Belfast, as he dropped a trid phantasm of an ordinary, functioning bank over the facade to stall for a little time. They're quirky, but effective, agreed Wildcard, from his safe position at the rooftop of a financial firm three blocks away. Remember to send word to Kara that we kept our side of the deal. Wildcard and Belfast watched from their respective vantage points as Dervish stunned Green with a body blow and then threw him into a street light so hard that it tipped and flickered. The blow would have killed an ordinary man, but the middle-aged Texan responded with a small flinch and a wicked roundhouse kick which Dervish caught, reversed, and used the leverage of to blow him into the street light again, snapping it clean in half. I don't see why that one even needs armor, noted Belfast, as he watched the laughing Dervish gather the livid, sputtering green into another sleeper hold. The sirens got closer, visible a few blocks away from Wildcard's position. Dervish yelled, I'll be sure to recommend you for promotion to my buddy Bradford nice fighting dragons, mostly said wildcard deadpan as he made for the fire escape at the side of the building he wasn't lying if you'll excuse me i need to bail him out of there godspeed chama 9 pm east moorland titanga the neighborhood was affluent and green filled with vanity gardens and perfectly manicured front lawns the houses were 20 sen relics stately and well upkept with modern amenities spas are reminded would be thieves of the neighborhood watch as well as the local PTA's meeting on Thursday. 9 o'clock was already bedtime, as far as East Moorland was concerned, leaving only one house with its lights conspicuously lit. Jenny Holderman answered the door in a negligee that left nothing to the imagination. It was admittedly not the most flattering outfit on her, given that the ensemble that her figure most complimented consisted of jackboots and body armor. Still, it was a welcome gesture. Dervish. Borrowing one of Locke's silk shirts, which was splitting at the seams on his catastrophically large muscles, shifted his body instinctively to loom over her. Tex strong arm reporting for duty. Mom, please, said Holderman, eyeing the street and not spotting Ben's hiding space perched atop her neighbor's roof. Call me Jenny, chummed. Jenny, said Dervish, with a toothy grin that he imagined was a roguish smile. Call me Dervish. Oh, you can bet your ass I will said Holderman, as she pulled Dervish into an open-mouthed kiss in the threshold of her doorway and then lead him inside. Through his own mouthful of three-hour-old fast food fries in the car across the street, 
Wildcard grumbled. Dervish gets groupies. I want groupies. It's the upside of public awareness, said Locke nonchalantly, as he held up a pair of fancy binoculars and stared out the window. Downside is everyone knows exactly where to find him. So in other words, said Wildcard, you get the best of both worlds. I dunno, said Locke, with a chipper shrug. I could still stand to be a little less well known. Can the chatter, subvocalized Ben. We got contact in the backyard. Ben marked the tack cloaked interloper on the team's tacknet as he vaulted to the roof of Halderman's house, silently sprinted toward the front porch, hung upside down from the overhang, and began picking the conventional lock on her door while still hanging. Now that there is a go-getter, gawked Wildcard, why now? Do you suppose easy? Responded Ben. They've marked Dervish as one of the big L's operators and are trying to see if the two of them share any game changing insights while in flagrante. They then marked the second infiltrator as he silently dropped from a nearby tree, producing a long, silenced pistol. The new infiltrator moved to settle in under one of the front windows while keeping a clear line of sight on the man at the doorway. Just as he appeared ready to shoot, pulled a man's recycling bin tipped open, upending a dragonfly drone which raced after the gunman, causing him to disengage and flee around the side of the house. This is surreal, commented Wildcard, as he observed the perfectly silent, invisible struggle, only able to witness it because of Ben's diligent highlighting, with a quiet path. A ninja materialized behind the upside down infiltrator right as he finished lock picking the door. As said ninja raised a garrote, he was suddenly knocked prone with the quietest of clack noises, trailing blood from a silenced gunshot that had emanated from the trash can next to the recycling bin. Quickly picking himself up, the wounded ninja absconded into the streets, ducking and dodging a spray of perfectly silenced gunfire as he made for a grey SUV across the way. Sensing that he had been made, the overhang infiltrator opened the door, climbed inside from his upside down position, and disappeared into the house right as loud sex noises began emanating from the window that the first gunman had previously been hiding under before being chased off by the drone. The first infiltrator left the door open, and a single silenced bullet was through the open doorway, mercifully not hitting anything loud. I'd better get in there, effortlessly, bend hopped roofs acrobatically swung from the overhang, and launched himself into a perfect overall into Holderman's tasteful living room, done up in 2050's kitsch. He landed in the middle of a gunpoint standoff between the first infiltrator and the second, whom had evidently circled around and entered through the back to avoid a dragonfly drone. A single R window displaying all of Holderman's phone calls from the last week hung open near to the first infiltrator, while the second was still holding some manner of paper dossier that he had extricated from a nearby bookshelf. The standoff was broken as Holderman cried oh shit, fuck me eee -e -e from the adjacent room, providing enough audio cover for the trigger happy trash can inhabitant to circle around the front doorway and begin popping off shots. The SUV carrying the wounded ninja fled off into the night as Ben and his two newfound friends dodged and flipped across the room, seeking cover. The silent gunfight suddenly stopped as there was a lull from the bedroom, with the last shot loudly cracking a kitchen tile and echoing around the house. All four infiltrators released muffled groans, as Ben was the first one back out the front door, circling around the side of the house again. The trash can man and the first infiltrator barreled out the door next, vaulting into the neighbor's yards. The gunman who had hidden in the tree was the last out, and Ben took the opportunity to stun gun him right in the neck before dragging his convulsing body across the lawn, where Locke finished him from afar with a stun bolt. Locke jogged into the street to help Ben load the man into Wildcard's trunk as Dervish walked into the living room, wearing only a hastily donned pair of boxers, his favorites. Patterned with little lunch at a caricatures, and his America San bandana. He yelled, Hey, I think you didn't lock your door right. It drifted open. Weird, as Dervish gave the team a thumbs up and a wink from across the street and closed and locked the door. Wildcard finished screwing the silencer onto his predator, sighted the trash can gunman settling into another trash can, casually walked up to it, lifted the lid, and fired the whole mag of gel rounds down into it. He lifted the lid again, reached in, and pulled the groaning man's mask off as his pan scanned the interloper's face. He said vocalized, one Jinsen fuck, taken out with the trash. We got an eye on our guy give me a moment to read his thoughts, cool, 
Wildcard loaded a mag of subsonic lethal rounds, double tapped the Jinsen infiltrator, and closed the trash can as a few more lights turned on across the street. He walked casually back to the car as Ben shuffled past him, invisible. Locke gulped over the technet. Ben asked, settling into the back of the Hyundai, what's up Gunter Lehman? Drake Prime. Loth was double booking on us. Official designation Drake Prime 2, with a heavy combatant he only knows as Drake Prime 1 and a spider handler he only knows as Drake Prime 3. Has no less than 3 suicide teeth. Well, said Wildcard, as he settled into the driver's seat, those'll have to come out before we have a misunderstanding. Bend cocked an invisible eyebrow. Sure we shouldn't just turn him loose Wildcard shrugged. What? And let Lothwir eat him better to act like this was our plan to get into contact with him all along. Salvage the situation and share some info with our employer. Point. Midnight. The 3rd of February. 2074. The River's Edge Hotel. Portland. Titanga Drake Prime 2 awoke. Naked. To water being splashed in his face. Instinctively. He attempted to bite down on his suicide tooth, then his two backups, only to find that all three had been removed and carefully sutured up. He then attempted to activate his own cranial bomb, only to find it disconnected. Finally, he groggily attempted to flip into a fighting stance, only to end up carrying the sturdy aluminum chair he was firmly cuffed down to the floor with an awkward clanking noise. You quite done. Fanny Boar's wild card put the bucket down by Lehman's head and crouched to make eye contact, or as close as could be approximated through his polarized lenses as his prey lay face down on the bathroom tiles. We took out all yeah kill yourself bizzo when we melted you last night, from there it was just a wee little dobber to the burn side, and here we are, you, grunted Lehman, in flawless, barely accented English. As he tried and failed to pass the Scottish vernacular, you're our shadow runners. Technically, said Locke, whom was leaning against the outside of the room's doorway, were your boss's runners, amigo. You weren't part of the deal when we took this job, you renegotiated with Johnson, said Lehman, flat and resentful, as he talked his body to look at his captors. You expressed doubt about your capabilities to carry through with the mission so we were called in. Locke stepped into the room as Wildcard moved to lift Lehman back into a sitting position. That would be true. If you weren't actually on the job since before we got here. Didn't know that you were the team that failed to intercept Alvarez when he first entered the tip. Afraid to go back home to your boss without results Lehman cringe. What do you want we're not gonna turn this into a daft bloody jurisdictional dispute. Said Wildcard patting Lehman on the shoulder, if you were worried about that, you'd have to be a feckin' roaster to try to compete over the same goal in this scenario, Yano so you're offering your cooperation, said Lehman, decisively, as he avoided eye contact with Wildcard or Locke, very well, I believe an exchange of information is in order, yes so long as it's a two way street, chumma, said Locke, with a sizzle and pop, Lehman's cuffs disengaged, as you wish, Lehman's words were pointed as he stretched his back and massaged his aching wrists. I assume that you've already identified Alvarez's tradition and possible aliases. Path of the Wheel. Most likely aliases Peter McKinley, Larry Coburn, James Lynch and Harrison Graham. Lehman shook his head. Take Graham off the list. He has been convinced by our liege to cooperate with us. Good to know, said Wildcard, taking notes. That leaves just Lynch and Coburn at the Mage's Conclave. Between both of our groups we can shadow each of them. Lehman nodded, resolute, as he settled back in the chair. His nudity did not seem to be bothering him. If Alvarez is planning on replacing one of them for the drone unveiling, he may very well have not made his move at all yet. We have reason to believe that he has chosen the drone unveiling, as we intercepted a communique between the target and a combat mage named Quakers to a rendezvous at the Museum of Science and Industry. That backs up our suspicions, agreed Wildcard. We identified the runners who were caught breaking in last week as being on Alvarez's payroll. However, our mutual friends in the field have the same intel. You mean the destroyers lock nodded. We know them as Jensen Corporation. Just because all signs point to the drone unveiling, noted Lehman, doesn't mean that the mage's conclave isn't a possibility, just a lesser one, commented Wildcard, anything else nothing vital, well then, said Locke, standing to the side, have a nice night, Mr. Lehman, 
your clothes are on the couch, cursing up a storm in German, Drake Prime 2 exited the hotel room, we've got 3 days till the conclave, noted Ben, finally materializing from his hiding spot in the hotel's closet. Sounds like just enough time to deal with the nightingales, said Locke, with a grin, Ben crossed his arms with a frown. How are we going to find them oh, that part's easy, chortled wildcard, bringing up the band's page 2.0 fan page. 10.15am, the 4th of February, the Heathman Bar, Portland, Titanga tulips fashionably and restrained black hair fell about her shoulders as she surveyed the bar. She and the Morrigan, her particular interpretation of the dark goddess mentor spirit, shared a metaphysical commentary on the nature of various men present at the bar this early. The discussion frequently came down to whether they'd make a good fight or a good lay. She and the Morrigan both agreed, most men who started drinking at 10 in the morning wouldn't make much of either. She continued to drink the world's most expensive Bloody Mary as she waited for Echo to finish parsing the data that Johnson wanted on the Amazonian chuckle fucks who had been coming after them for the last few days. She wore the same little black dress that she had worn yesterday. It fit as well as ever. Over at the table where Echo was zonked, Gillette's delicate, lethal titanium fingers danced across a fork and knife as the old school razor girl munched on a single order of eggs benedict. She actually required fairly minimal calories, so this would serve as her food for most of the day. A lack of any organic limbs tended to cut down on metabolic needs. Where's Tweak at Tulip lazily sub over to the street samurai, Gillette yawned, angled her beautiful alpha wear cyber arm to take another bite, and sub back, her voice as ice cold as her eyes, is, and limbs, she ran out of nitro, again. Tulip groaned and placed her empty glass down on the counter. Girls lucky that so many dealers are in town for festival season. Gillette rolled her featureless chrome sibaris. It was a purposeful gesture, meant to express emotion that wasn't really there so that Tulip would be more comfortable. Girls really lucky we haven't kicked her temper ass out for being such a little junkie, says class I cyber psychosis incarnate. Gillette round, dully hurt. Hey, I take my meds. Just joking. He e tulip glanced towards the party being seated at the next table over. What do I think? Gillette fight or fuck Gillette grinned uncannily, revealing gleaming white, natural, teeth beneath her thin lips. The little Hispanic guy, or the big orc because I'm all over the orc. Tulip tossed a saucy glance back to Gillette. You didn't answer the question. I choose both. You can't choose both you have to choose one with that. Echo left her technomancer trance and said aloud, pouting, you guys are being really gross. After a second or so of awkward lag time, Gillette affectionately tousled Echo's bleach blonde hair with her glimmering palm. Tulip, whose idea was it to bring a 16 year old along on a prime run again Echo pouted even harder as Tulip laughed aloud and finished her drink. Mine, for the umpteenth time. Technomancers of her caliber are hard to come by. The shamelessly matrix addicted high school prodigy grinned and dropped back into net space, her eyes lolling as she slumped in her chair. She makes the weirdest faces when she does that, observed Gillette, before taking another bite of her eggs benedict. How about you tulip batted her eyelashes flirtatiously as she gestured for the bartender to bring her another drink. How about me want the guys at the table over there eating waffles? With the orc that I can't have both ways, oh. Tulip spun on her brass jewel and shot a roguish smirk at Gillette. I want the Hispanic guy, lucky you, snarked Gillette. He looks like he wants you too. As Locke approached the bar with a sheepish smile, Gillette closed comms with, although you didn't say whether you wanted to fight or fuck. So, said Tulip, twisting her glass between thumb and forefinger, what's your line? Handsome I hadn't decided yet. I was thinking something disarming and a little self-aware, Locke plopped down onto the stool next to Tulip, swiveling to face her. Nothing seems to be coming to mind, though. Tulip glanced knowingly over to the large orc, who had stood and approached Gillette and Echo's table. Given the synchronized approach you boys are going with, I get the impression that you were looking for us. It's hard not to, said Locke as he placed a cred stick on the bar top and then levitated a bottled beer into his hand from the exposed refrigerator. The barman shot him a dirty look, but Tulip was amused. You've got a bright aura. Tulip hissed laughter through her teeth, 
I ask you what your line is, and you blow it on some stupid mage and get out of here. Cowboy she flapped a hand dismissively in Locke's direction, bidding him to go, although she was only half serious about it. You're lucky you're so damn photogenic or I'd have slugged you. I couldn't resist the joke, laugh Locke, and I promise you, I'm not going to turn that into a line too. In all honesty, I'm actually here because I need some information from you. Tulip hid her disappointment behind a saccharine smile. We're not really in that business, chumma, Locke just smiled wider. I think I can make it worth your while. My name's Vincent da Selva. I'm an intelligence officer acting to protect the cast interests, and mages, in the tier until the festival situation is over. I know that you're runners, but don't worry. You're out of my jurisdiction. I'm actually here because I've been digging up some skirmishes here between Amazonian and Aztec agents, and I want to make sure that it doesn't spill over politically onto us. He gave Tulip a piercing glare, his voice becoming serious. I'm not interested in what you girls are doing here. So if you could tell us all you know I could negotiate to get some serious material in for you. Christ. You can't just say all that in the open. Locke gestured to a white noise generator which he had surreptitiously placed at the end of the bar. Tulip relaxed, placed her drink to her lips, and downed the whole thing. Okay. You get to live a little longer, handsome. Let's get right down to brass tacks. Business before pleasure. I can admire that. Locke said, with a smirk. I imagine that I wasn't in the wrong to assume that you'd run afoul of our mutual enemy if you're talking about Jinsen Corporation. Synergistic management for a diverse future. Sighed Tulip, rolling her eyes and gesturing for another drink. Then you have no idea. We've got everything you could possibly want to know on those assholes, but it's going to cost you. Locke nodded slowly. If Tulip knew about the fi fight between Jinsen and his team, she was doing an exceedingly good job of hiding it. Not beyond her capabilities, but if she knew the threat posed by he and Dervish, then Tulip should have taken the opportunity to initiate the attack the moment they'd been isolated. But, Tulip continued, you get to incentivize me, G-man. I don't sing for free, I don't imagine that you do, grinned Locke. I was thinking I'd squire you about the mage's conclave. Fine dining and luxuriant treatment all day, and a fat cred stick at the end of it all. With you marking every bogey you spot at the conclave. Naturally, there doesn't seem to be a number associated with fat cred stick. Government salary only goes so far, but I'm prepared to offer 5 grand and immunity to prosecution from to homeland security for the entirety of your job here. Lied Locke. Tulip's eyes lit up. Your influence goes that deep I can call up the agent handling the conclave right now and arrange the details. Tulip shot Echo's table a glance. While Dervish and Gillette flirted animatedly, Echo returned Tulip's look and nodded slowly. She'd compromised Locke's comlink, and the number in question was legit. Locke actually had the relevant to Homeland Security agents in his frequent contacts. My technomancer assures me that you're not lying. Frankly, this isn't an opportunity we can pass up. Locke cocked an eyebrow. Your technomancer shouldn't be hacking my phone. Precautions. Agent Dar Selva. Precautions. Fair enough. Why don't we take tomorrow to get to know one another lock smile, and design a pheromone glance, briefly pierce Tulip's defenses, and she let loose a capricious laugh. Sure. Why not I'm on a sporadic schedule, said Locke, standing and straightening out his rumpled pants, but we'll work something out. Here's my number. Tulip punched the number into her comlink and reached out to accept her next drink. Be seeing you and your big friend. I hope not. Chuckled Locke, as he walked away from the bar. He's got work tomorrow and should know better. Noon, the Heathman Hotel annex Locke, having taken a taxi around the block so as not to be seen directly stepping into the super getaway high and die, reconnoitered with wildcard in the hotel parking lot. His gadgets dimmed upon exposure to Ben's smart jammer, placed inconspicuously in one of the car folders. Once the score wildcard brought up a photo of a brutalized drug dealer, Accompanied by the dossier of a wiry but attractive young woman in a leather jacket, Jean shorts, and a pair of combat boots. Meet our weak link. Street name Tweak. Temporary infill for another bandmate, who's currently out in Los Angeles with a bad case of corpsec-induced coma. Locke nodded. 
I heard something about a nitro addiction wildcard scrolled through a Vice article on the drug. Raging. Designer combat drug. Speedball in an inhaler. Intended for trolls in war-torn balkanized zones. She probably transitioned from a Novocoke addiction as her gateway. Lock gawked. How the hell she survive that crap some kind of supercharged immune system? Burnout adept. Couldn't peg the tradition. So what's the plan wildcard opened a secured line to Ben. Easy. We've heard Ben scoping out their rooms at this hotel. They're sharing two suites on the third floor. We figure out some way to make Tweak have reason to not trust the rest of the team, think she's being replaced, maybe, and we wait for it to devolve before pulling a police tip on the whole thing. Lock Crin. We're involving the cops in this really easiest way to handle it, honestly. Shrugged Wildcard. How are we doing up there? Bend Bend came in over the encrypted channel. His voice surprisingly clear through the smart jammer. A lot of chemicals. But I'm pretty certain they're of the cosmetic rather than the explosive variety. No dice on any sensitive details yet. The big resorgural's coming back into the room so I think I'll put the stake out on hold for the time being. Solid copy. Nodded wildcard. 9.30am. The 5th of February. The Heart Coffee Bar. Portland. Titanga so. How's it work out for you being a, you know, lock trailed off over his mocha chai latte. It was real coffee, rather than soy calf, but that was where most of the expense had gone. The coffee was watery and a little clean, relying on its expensive beans to do the work for it. Tulip's hand traced down to her own coffee, briefly obstructing Locke's view of her ample, and expertly placed, cleavage. A shadow runner it's not so bad. A lot of people treat it as if it's the scrounging dregs of the criminal world. No syndicate, no connections, and all that, that's just the chumps. Though, the real experts make enough money to share. Locke, clearly not enjoying his chai monstrosity, tipped yet another packet of artificial sweetener into its murky doldrums. The impression I got from that statement is that you consider yourself an expert. Tulip crossed her arms and pouted. I don't like being doubted. Locke put his hands up an apology. Hardly I just don't have a lot of experience with your side of things, is all. Well, you're in the hands of the best of the best. Side Tulip. Even if the best of the best is currently making a premium to rat on a bunch of mer chucklefucks. Speaking of which, said Locke, reaching into his pocket. I have your two and a half grand for forward expenses right here. I imagine that's good form Tulip rolled her eyes and scoffed. Although her posture eased. God, you're such a square. Good form would have you in mirror or shades calling yourself Mr. Johnson. So gosh Locke laughed and finally settled to just swipe his coffee cup off into his periphery. There are some guys who can pull off the look. Offered Tulip. I think you could manage it. Despite the job title. I don't go in very much for the spy thing. Smiled Locke. Now what say we talk about the plan for tomorrow Tulip brought up on our screen. Finally in her element. I'd love to. 10 10 AM. The 5th of February. The Heathman Hotel. Portland. Titanga. Bent crept around the Nightingale's hotel rooms. Straining to maintain an invisibility spell atop his tactical cloak. Redundancies were necessary. Especially with a zonked out technomancer at the writing desk who could snap out of it at any time. As Echo mumbled something about intel and background checks, he carefully leafed through the Nightingale's belongings. Although they were sleeping in two adjacent rooms, they had left the divider open between them and had stashed most of their gear in a single closet. The drug paraphernalia was tweaks, obviously, as were the scrunched up soy beers strewn about her unmade bed. Gillette Street Samurai gear was locked away into some manner of custom case. Although a little clever lockpicking found a wide assortment of knives and firearms. Echo had mostly packed trendy electronics and kitschy collectibles. Reminding Ben that she was, in fact, still a teenager. He would make an effort to spare her if at all possible. Tulip had brought numerous vanity objects and changes of clothing. Although there was nothing overtly incriminating. Satisfied. He returned to Tweak's bedside and scoped around for anything that could be used to drive a wedge between her and the team. Although the well-loved leather gun case, with tiny brass plates reading Avarice and Envy, presumably the names of the twin Thunderbolt pistols, underneath her bed was empty, it did give him an idea. Guys, he subvocalized. I've got this. 
I'm going to be hanging out in this neighborhood tonight. The rest of you are on the conclave tomorrow with Tulip. The Nightingales will be done by lunchtime tomorrow. Roger. Bent, responded Wildcard. Need anything on your end Bent bailed out the open window flawlessly, without touching anything to make noise. With a front flip, he tagged the balcony with his gecko grips and began his descent. Yeah, actually. Can you call up your cyber doc and just get me a mock up of a cyber arm blueprint 11.30am. The 6th of February, the River's Edge Hotel, Portland. Titanga tweak awoke as she usually did, mad at the world and feeling vaguely inadequate for reasons that she couldn't quite put her finger on. Her body jolted into motion moments before her mind did, courtesy of regular, drug-fueled nightmares that interacted badly with her long-ignored adept magic and combined to create a sensation of disconnect akin to full-body phantom limb syndrome. Tweak liked the disconnect for the same reason she liked the drugs and the booze. It dulled the pain of being Tweak, and that made it easier to put the hurt on the poor sons of bitches who took on the Nightingales. Throwing on a tank top and a pair of boy shorts, both from yesterday, she yawned heartily, stood up from her bed, and stumbled into the bathroom. After haphazardly brushing her teeth, she stomped back into the common area, pulled her umpteenth beer from the mini fridge, and promptly rendered the tooth brushing meaningless. Belatedly, her eyes wandered to Gillette's bed. It was perfectly made, which suggested that Gillette had been gone for a while, as always. Rather than bother to peek around the divider and look into the other room, she merely contented herself with yelling at the top of her lungs. Yo Gillette, echo there was a murmur, echo get the fuck out of VR echo grumbled meekly from the other room, what do you want? Tweak where a Gillette and Tulip wow, indoor voice. Gillette is off running reckon for Johnson and Tulip is squiring some G-man boy toy around the conclave. Won't that put Johnson at risk we told him to stay put sighing. Echo finally stood up and tramped over to the doorway between the room. She was wearing a set of teddy bear pajamas, which were perhaps a little bit infantilizing for a teenager, but she was a late bloomer. We can trust Johnson to do his own thing at this point, Tulip said. The less we know about the museum handoff the better for all of us. Fucking always taking orders from Tulip, grunted Tweak, as she flopped down on her bed, absently groping beneath it. She's the face, said Echo, sternly. Exactly. Not the leader, just the face. Fucking Hollywood rules. Well the note on out if I knew how this shit worked coming out of the Seattle scene. You're drunk, responded Echo. Always, laughed Tweak with something approaching mirth, as she withdrew the leather case from beneath the bed. She sobered up quick. Echo responded to Tweak's sudden expression of confusion and anger by taking a step back from the doorway. What's up Tweak looked up at Echo, her expression accusing and hurt. Envy is missing. You're probably just misplaced. I never misplace my guns Tweak dramatically stood from the bed and threw the covers off in a single fluid motion, her eyes on fire. Look. You were pretty coked out last night and, Tweak's glare shut Echo up as she repeated, I, never, misplace, my, guns, as Tweak tore up bedspread, then curtains, and finally began pulling out the drawers on the Tridia cabinet, a lone wireless signal flitted through space just long enough for Echo to briefly catch it, it was a text message, the message read now, terrified, Echo glanced at the windows, then the door, Afraid for an imminent ambush, but none was immediately forthcoming. There were no gas grenades, no attack shoppers. No, the most imminently dangerous thing in the room was still her teammate Tweak, who was standing, livid, with tears staining her caked on mascara, as she stopped in the middle of pulling out another drawer. Tweak became the second most dangerous thing in the room when, with a slam, the door opened and Gillette spilled in. Gillette gasped. With as much urgency as her emotionless facade could muster, I got your emergency signal, Tweak. What's happened Echo realized belatedly that Tweak didn't have her phone. A moments back during registered that it had sent the team's mutual emergency signal from the hotel parking lot, but Tulip hadn't received the message. Stuttering, Tweak pulled Envy from the cabinet drawer, and with it, printed out on real paper, to keep it away from the prying eyes of any meddling technomancers. 
a glorious, wonderfully optimized schematic for a hypothetical grafting of the gilded thunderbolt into Gillette's distinctive cyberarm. Both the gun and the cyberarm were depicted on the schematic in stunning detail. Clearly the work of someone who had a vested interest in observing the mechanical interactions in both. H how ll long, how long, Gillette held out her arms in a disarmed gesture, but she couldn't help the gleam in her cyber eyes and the instinctive heavy breath she made as she first glimpsed the schematic. Any proof of her innocence was drowned away in a sudden and crushing onset of her cyber psychosis. Echo watched on with horror, immediately recognizing what the other two didn't, the work of an outsider playing directly to the team's psychological weaknesses. It occurred to her far, far too late that this hypothetical outsider might have also tampered with Tweak's drugs. Fucking cunt as Echo screamed, Tweak dropped the schematic, drew avarice from her hip holster, and in a singular fluid motion, the combat adept kicked her bandolier up from her bedside, speed loaded two mags of apps, and began blasting. The hotel door behind Gillette burst into the hallway in pieces as she crashed through, blocking her vulnerable meat body with her prosthetics. Her right cyber arm exploded at the elbow, its haywire servos sending shrapnel careening across the carpet. Echo's protests were met with speed and fury, both combatants had the finest in magical and technological reflex enhancers, and so were already fighting for their lives before the technomancer could get the words out. Sliding balletically on her heels, Gillette caught the hallway wall and launched herself directly at Tweak, catching a few more bullets for her troubles and thus only badly cutting the adept's thigh as she stumbled and crashed through the trade cabinet, scattering the smashed hardwood as easily as the papers on its surface. As she launched a heel out to sweep Tweak's weakened legs, Tweak backflipped onto her own bed before catching her wounded thigh wrong and collapsing onto the headboard with a gruesome slam. Cunt slag whore seeing her moment, Gillette silently stood and leapt for her prone opponent, but Tweak, leashing a blood cuddling howl, set her custom pistols to switch ammo from the smart mags and promptly planted two explosive rounds in Gillette's forehead as Gillette was airborne and unable to navigate. The street samurai briefly ricocheted off the ceiling, cracking the light fixtures, before collapsing on the divider between the beds with a pockmarked cyber skull, a ruined cyber eye, and shattered limbs. As Tweak huffed and stood over Gillette's twitching body, aiming her guns at the street samurai's head, Echo tried to shout, it's a setup we don't know that she, shut up Tweak fired a warning shot at the wall near Echo, but as she still had explosive rounds loaded, it instead blasted clean through the wall and sent debris scattering into Echo's room. Bitch is always talking down to me. Well I get the last laugh now because, there was a horrendous crack as Gillette whirled her weapons case out from under the bed, snapping Tweak's non-wounded leg clean at the ankle and cracking the case open from the force. As the howling adept tumbled, guns firing wildly, the samurai produced her katana from the case and leveled it below Tweak's neck. The decapitation wasn't a clean one. As Tweak fell on the bleed, it cut deep through her throat, showering gore on the pastel-covered carpet of the hotel room, but wedged below her skull. As Tweak gurgled and struggled, Gillette spun on the ground and leveraged her weight onto the handle, pulling the blade through and sending Tweak's head careening off into the room with a sound like tearing leather. Sputtering and coughing up blood, Gillette crawled towards the schematics, the new object of her affection. As Echo retreated into her own room, unable to come to terms with what she had just seen, she screeched aloud when she nearly backed into an elf in a set of tack cloaked military spec armor. The man looked at her dispassionately, his face obscured but for the frown on his handsome jaw. We called the cops three minutes ago, Echo. You'll want to get out of here. Ben waited for Echo to calm down. BBB but TT Tulip, she'll be shacked up at my friend's hotel room for at least another hour. And when she gets back I expect you to be gone, just like Tweak is and Gillette will be. Tears welled up from Echo's eyes as she began bawling, falling to her knees. Bend recoiled, visibly uncomfortable with the turn of events. WH where? Go back to Los Angeles. Get a sin and an education. Keep making music if you think it will make you happy. Boots tramped in the hallway. WH why because we're after your boss, and you got in the way. Bend paused. Grab anything you absolutely need and I'll open the window for you. If you take the fire escape it should buy you a little extra time. Echo didn't need to be told twice. 12am, midnight, the 7th of February. The River's Edge Hotel. 
Portland. Titanga the team reconvened in their hotel room, faces grim. Wildcard tossed our windows across the room in a frenetic hurry, coalescing all of the team's newly acquired data. Locke was the last into the room, shading his blazer with a huff. Bend was the first to speak up. How'd it go? Champ Tulip was shattered. Echoes a wall and Gillette's comatose and under police lockdown in the hospital. You think you were made Locke grit his teeth? No. Until the cold reality of it set in, it was actually a pretty nice date. Sorry, offered Ben. Locke waved a dismissive hand. Wildcard asked, what about Lynch and Coburn? I made sure to keep my eyes on Lynch. And Lehman followed Coburn all day. They're both clean, for now. With a frustrated huff. Locke added, I'm plugging in the new info on Jensen's armaments and personnel to the DB. They are mostly using a conglomeration of Merc outfits from around the Mesa American CZ. But the core group all have similar orgs. Mostly Bioware all rounder stuff. But there's also some interesting things like hydraulic jacks to look out for. Dervish's eyebrow cocked at the last detail. So we're assuming it has to be the museum wildcard nodded as he pieced together multiple sources of intel from across the run. Harry Dexter, Drake Prime, Schwarzkopf, Jensen themselves, Haldeman and the Nightingales. Even a master stealth adept like Alvarez couldn't pull a hoax this big. There are too many compounding factors. I know so, responded Wildcard, tapping the back of his own cranium to indicate his meat head rather than the ever-present mask. Custom made for micromanagement, with that in order then, said Ben, slowly, let's go over what we're all going to be doing to prepare for the 23rd, we've got a little over 2 weeks, you're going to be working with me, said Wildcard, familiarize yourself with the layout of the museum of science and industry, inch by inch. They're going to be doing a security sweep right before the event, and I need you to install a few hundred stealth cameras in between the sweep and the doors opening to the guests. I assume I'm in charge of procuring the cameras wildcard just nodded silently at Ben. Right. I can probably swing some favors through the eyes, my spy toy dealer, and maybe see if I can't get Formic or Brianna pulling some extras. You mind doing the pickup after I make contact with my dealer I feel like I'm better used here in the tip, naturally, agreed wildcard, cool. Tridia or vid just vid, no sense in breaking the bank, said wildcard, get yourself a tridia, though, for when you're mapping out the museum, we'll also have you sitting with all your gear in storage down there for the last couple of days, since that's the obvious location for any magical artifacts, which is why Alvarez won't use the storage, commented Locke, maybe he's that stupid, counted wildcard, causing Locke to scoff, Locke asked, Okay, so how about me simple, said wildcard, your bait, Locke blinked, I'm what, well, not entirely, you'll serve multiple functions, however, we need you on the ground floor of the party TSN's Peter McKinley, Larry Coburn, and James Lynch, assume that they'll have been replaced by Alvarez mere moments before the party, wildcard pulled up a file on the AS technology compound in Portland, and continued, in turn, this will require you to operate openly and show your face, which will expose you to the AS technology assets who will doubtless be on site, searching for Alvarez. Although this is purely ad hoc, we could use the opportunity to trump one of their agents and get a little more last minute info. Locke gulped. What's my insurance here easy? I'll be running comms and monitoring the cameras from the parking lot. Say you run into trouble. You make it to me, we jump onto the 405 at 400 kilometers an hour, if I make it to you. Wildcard's metallic tone betrayed not a hint of emotion. Yes, after a long pause, Locke sighed. Okay, fine, how do I get in I'd need to be invited by Hesterby or one of the other big shots. Funny you should mention that, said Dervish. We took care of that today with a call to Johnson. Locke was earnestly surprised. Wouldn't having Schwartzkopf vouch for our entry into the party blow our cover which is why, said Ben. Schwartzkopf promised he'd work on Hesterby. She probably knows we're here already, so there's not much lost in playing nice with a passive participant, and Hesterby will agree to this dervish shrugged. Johnson seemed to think so. Locke placed his thumb and forefinger on his eyes as he collapsed into a cheap armchair. What was this about not making deals with dragons again? Dervish chuckled. We're already double fucked. Why not make it triple besides? 
It's just an invite. Fancy stationery and a tuxedo. No scales off her back. Speaking of double fucked. Interrupted wildcard. Let's talk about your role. Dervish. Dervish made a non-committal grunt. You're going to do exactly what you've been doing. And that's to act as a provisional security guard at the museum. Year on. Wildcard coughed. Good terms with the head of security. And it'd be a shame not to use that. What about my armor and weapons dervish glanced over at the heavy roller suitcase that contained his sniper rifle, shotgun, and disassembled America San armor, nestled near the hotel room's bathroom. Wildcard pulled up a few rent-a-car websites, tossing the R windows over to dervish. I'll rent a van remotely on the day of the gala and Kara will transport all of our really nasty stuff there through the security perimeter before I slave it to my nexus. That way if we need to use the car to flee we can have our gear in a ready to go location. Oh course, I'll be fully armed up in the car. Smart. Responded Irvish. Although he didn't elaborate further, there was a silence as the whole team took a collective deep breath. Ben hazarded. You guys wanna, like, watch a movie or something fucking hell. Laughed Dervish. I thought nobody was going to ask. Hand me a beer. 9am. The 17th of February, 2074, Museum of Science and Industry, Portland. Titan Gaia Bend watched from the basement shadows for the umpteenth time as a maintenance crew swapped out the ammo tank on the Raz Farcast Fab Dispersal Drone. It was a clunky thing, brutish but functional, designed to clear out insect spirits and other dual-natured creatures with weaponized chemicals. There was evidently going to be a demonstration of the drone at work up in the main hall. Involving it using its ammo selector to kill and spare different types of magical plants in quick succession. But the regular maintenance crews needed to make sure that none of the ammo cartridges leaked or contaminated the main firing mechanism. Bend had gathered this because when he had first passed in front of the drone, an automated hologram of Matrix Security Director McWilliams had appeared in response to his motion and talked him through the hypothetical demonstration that the drone thankfully had not done in the middle of the storage basement. It was a little unnerving to see a former teammate in virtual intelligence form trying to make a sales pitch for a glorified bug sprayer. But then, Ben surmised, it was probably 2D's baby. He always did have a thing for killer drones, and it seemed that Raz was capitalizing on that skill set. Returning his attention to the new boxes across the room, Ben slunk behind the maintenance crew and examined the arrivals. Most were the sort of cases that were used to carry conventional antiques with only a few that were thick enough or made of the right materials to hide a magical artifact. Double checking over each shoulder, he cracked the shielded boxes just long enough to ascend, and was left disappointed. A few magical auras, yes, but nothing on the magnitude he was seeking. Resigned, he slunk back across the room to the maintenance elevator doors and climbed into the vent above them, settling atop the elevator. It had been a long week, and it was going to be a long week yet. 11 a.m., the 19th of February, 2074, Castle Rock, Washington, Salish shit wildcard tapped his left loafer impatiently against his car door as he slowly drew up to the tit checkpoint from the Seattle outbound freeway. For the 15th time, he went through his identification for William Carpenter, the cas attaché to a mostly fictional diplomat. Everything was in order. But Wildcard had felt on edge ever since the dinner date at the Blue Bohemian back on the 29th and it wasn't a feeling that abated lightly. Naturally, the 237 fingernail sized spy cameras that he had crammed into every corner of his car were not doing anything to make him feel more secure about passing into the tiff for the second time. He took a deep breath and checked the rear view mirror to make sure that his expression was human like as he approached the kiosk. A disinterested soldier in full mil-spec loadout approached the car, brandishing a Kimbo a battle rifle and an e-clipboard. This level of armor was unusual on the border guards, Wildcard noticed. The two was probably starting to catch on to exactly how much shit was about to go down. Name William Carpenter. Purpose for visit the soldier's words were curt. Reconnoitering with my companions. In keeping with a visit earlier this month, I sent the details ahead. The soldier put his fingers to the earpiece built into the side of his helmet. A few tense seconds pass. Everything seems to check out, sir. Wildcard had almost slammed on the gas when the soldier put his hand out. And so Wildcard rolled his half-raised window back down and peered out. 
Yes, Jordan Formig sends his regards, and requests that you don't break any government property. Wildcard managed a thin smile, the closest thing his meat face got to a grin. Oh course, 1pm, the 21st of February, 2074, the River's Edge Hotel, Portland. Titangai lock paced in the hotel room, trying and failing to pay attention to 2073's premiere pay-per-view documentary, Jet Black. The untold story, Wildcard was zonked out in VR in the walk-in closet, calibrating his nexus individually to every tiny camera in a massive box of such, and deducting a rebate for each, individually, from the team's forward expense account, and Bend and Dervish were both at the museum doing their respective duties. This gave Locke plenty of time to fret. He refamiliarized himself with the three men that he would be identifying, and, if need be, bagging and tagging. At the Swery, the first tar window to his fingertips was Larry Coburn, the obvious target. Coburn, the Telestrian Industries importer, was a generically photogenic brunette with a smile that belonged to an equally photogenic barracuda. He would doubtless be handling above-board magical wheeling and dealing during the gala, and so it would be simple enough for Alvarez to pursue his agenda under that cover. Locke would check Coburn first. The next dossier was on James Lynch. The Horizon Liaison, a blonde Hollywood type with a chiseled jawline. It was worrying to imagine Alvarez with the Dawkins group at his beck and call. It was even more worrying to imagine that Alvarez was, as the team feared, being extracted by Dawkins. Artifact in tow. Locke prepared himself for the distinct possibility that he would have to kill James Lynch on the 23rd, regardless of whether he was actually Rodrigo Alvarez or not. The final possibility was Peter McKinley, a distinguished four-star general. By elven standards of distinguished, he had the regal bearing of an old man, but looked to be 25. McKinley was a talented combat mage, but by all accounts Alvarez was an assassin who required the element of surprise to be effective. An attack on McKinley, were he Alvarez and not the real deal, would go in Locke's favor. But either McKinley himself or an impersonator could bring to bear the might of the Tim military, which had recently been gearing up their MPS for the upcoming fracas with Jensen. Locke didn't like any of the options, but didn't have much further time to contemplate just how fucked he was. A knock on the door heralded a much more immediate concern, although when he attempted to determine just who was at the door, by way of assessing, ultrasound goggles, and peering through the peephole in the door with his sidearm at the ready, he found that there was only a single piece of fine vellum parchment on the hallway rug. Briefly cracking the door to snatch it from a crouching posture, he put his back to the door as he slammed it shut and unfurled the parchment. It read, applying to one Mr. Felix Ramirez and guest to be redeemed on Saturday the 23rd of February in the year 2074 at 8 o'clock in the evening at the Museum of Science and Industry in Portland. Titanga to attend the technological gala at the invitation of the Orange Queen. Dragon Keeper of Meta Humanity has to be lock wiped a bead of sweat from his brow. Dios mio. 3 p.m. The 22nd of February, 2074. Downtown Public Parking Complex. Portland. Titanga Dervish approached the rear of the rented van, which was marked up with the logo of Danny's Pizzeria, which was, after a little research, Revealed to have been foreclosed in April 2072. It was a chunky looking vehicle. Like a brick on wheels. But this brick on wheels was packing mad heat. This the one car of the smuggler's throaty voice responded over the other end. Everything should be accounted for. D. Dervish didn't even bother to check over his shoulder. His sonar and radar senses ensured him that there was nobody else in the structure as he slammed the key. Manual lock. Like the old school models into the doors and slammed them open. If I could cry, Kara, said Dervish, his tusks jutting forward as he broke out into a full face grin, I would be. It was glorious. Dervish felt like Howard Carter opening the tomb of King Tut. Or he would have, anyway, if he had any idea who the fuck Howard Carter was. Plastic explosives frolic with armor piercing sabots of every caliber. An entire backpack filled to the brim with X-explosive rounds leaned precariously against a fire and forget missile launcher. Wildcards have R stood out from a rack of disposable SMGs, their numbers hastily scrubbed both digitally and in meat space. Locke's LMG sat atop a pyramid of breaching tools, 
a greater testimony to the glory of his gods than Tenochtitlan ever was. Crossed in the back like a pair of dualist sabers were Dervish's over-modified shotgun, attached grenade launcher in tow, and anti-material rifle, each an instrument of death at ranges that the other couldn't manage. Only one thing was missing, until Dervish peered beneath the upholstery of the van and saw just the tip of a 300 pound, red, white and blue boot with inbuilt thrusters. It's beautiful, he murmured, as much to himself and perdition as to Kara. You think that's great, she responded, over his earpiece, I've been working with Wildcard, Formic and your Johnson to try to get your helicopter in city, Dervish ran a hand lovingly over the titanium knee pads of his armor suit. Any luck with that not so far, but I think we may manage a miracle by tomorrow, the mention of tomorrow snapped Dervish out of his reverie. You said you'd be getting this into the parking structure across the street, right Kara paused. She hadn't been interrogated on this point, that's the idea, I'm a little worried about how quickly I could get to the gear in a crisis situation, Kara's response was flat, grounded, I told you before, any closer and it's risky, you don't want the shooting to start early, especially at a smuggler like me, and especially with a load this hot, I don't think shooting's going to matter when this turns into the okay, Corral, countered dervish, looking through the high explosive grenades fitted for his launcher. Okay, Corral Kara let loose a croaking laugh. Try another Operation Reciprocity. 5 p.m., the 23rd of February, 2074, Razam, Seattle, downtown Seattle. Yuka's security director Malcolm McWilliams furiously masturbated himself beneath his office desk as he gaped, open-mouthed, at the most recent projected profits graph on his new drone. The PR guys had just come through with a redesign that added a bunch of sleek futuristic bits to the chassis that really made the whole thing pop with that Raz pizzazz, and diving into the drone from afar while the maintenance guys affixed the new additions had him in such a tizzy that he let his meat body's urges get the better of him. Twody very frequently let his meat body's urges get the better of him. He was dimly aware of his manager's presence somewhere in the periphery of his matrix-filled vision, but it wasn't until Mr. Nice sent him a message digitally that he really registered it. From Bradford Nice, content. For fuck's sake McWilliams put your pants back on no, said Twody, returning to reality with dick in hand and annoyed boss and door frame. No nice restrained a laugh at the absurdity of the situation. As I distinctly recall, said Wody, still making no moves to lift his belt from the floor, my 15 minute break starts at 5 and my savant matrix security techniques are not to be questioned during me time. Nice made a gagging noise. If you didn't get such great results I'd have you shot, you know I once jacked off while simultaneously controlling like 15 of those rail mounted turret guns on level B3 I perforated the stroll runner in a ballistic suit. Best fap of my life, are you quite done there was a short pause and then the clinking of Twody's belt buckle as he finally donned his slacks. Yeah, I guess. You ruined the moment I was having with my robot, nice. Like always, nice hazarded a peek over the top of the desk and let out a sigh of relief. I was coming in to let you know that operation, prototype has been greenlit. Twody's eyes glinted like a Christmas tree. No shit the board signed off and everything nice smiled calmly. To a man, they all agreed that the asset would be better in brass hands than one of our rivals. What kind of resources am I looking at for starters? Firewatch 1 is getting shipped out from Detroit on the first suborbital we can launch. We're looking into getting one of the new gunships loaded up in time. Word is there's been terrorist threats in the area and the board doesn't like to take chances. 2D gawked, his wavering lips caught between the expressions of awestruck joy and grinning malice. Operational authority nice stretched his lips flat against his teeth and squinted before admitting. Full. There was a lull as 2D placed his elbows on his desk and pent his fingers together in front of his face, aping his best evil genius pose. This isn't doing anything to kill my raging hard-on. Bradford. Nice leaned in and made eye contact with 2D. It was much closer than he would have liked, but it helped to emphasize a point that he needed to make. Just get results. Malcolm. 2D let out a shrill, childish giggle that just increased in pitch as cruelty bled into his tone. For a moment, Nice saw him exactly as he was on the inside. A barely postadolescent demonic man-child, relishing in all the new toys that Hell had belched forth for him to break. 
Oh, I'll get results, Bradford. I'll get your fucking results. 8 p.m., the 23rd of February, 2074, the Museum of Science and Industry, Portland. Titanga Lock produced a handkerchief and wiped the persistent, nervous sweat from his face as he approached the front of the museum, lining up behind a duck's row of hotty totty high society elves all at least as attractive, if not more, than he was. On his arm was Julia Rothschild, the Tidot agent, in a dressed up little black dress, which had not been his best last minute decision, all things considered. So am I just lining up for disaster to strike all my friends is that what happens to your one night stands she was referring, of course, to Tulip, whom she had witnessed Locke spending the entire afternoon at the mage's conclave with, reasonably speaking, Locke should have accounted for the fact that the agent in charge of running security at the conclave would notice him there, especially when part of his bluff had involved putting Tulip and Rothschild in contact, I had nothing to do with that, look, Julia. You're not a one night stand. First, this is our second night out, and second, we just fooled around a little, and Felix Ramirez Julia hissed, peevish. Just one of my cover identities, said Locke, reassuringly. Julia seemed placated by this. Couldn't you have named your cover identity something less stupid sounding that hurt? I don't get to choose my cover identities, grumbled Locke, as they neared the front of the line. Rothschild tugged on Locke's sleeve, excited. Oh, hey, look at the top of the entrance stairs was a harshly angular, strikingly tall woman with gorgeous locks of auburn hair, flowing freely over an elegant Rococo-style gown done up in earthy greens and rich golds. Her posture was regal and impeccable, but as she shook the hand of one guest and embraced another, it was very clear that she was taking every possible step to appear approachable and welcoming. Locke's tongue dried up as he tried to fight down a small panic attack. H has to be, Locke stuttered as he made, for the third time in as many months, direct eye contact with a great dragon in her human form. Hester B's smile was earnest, betraying no intent to speculation. And you must be the inimitable Felix Ramirez. I recognize that you've brought with you a woman of some acquaintance to me. It's good to see you again, Julia. You did excellent work at the Mage's Conclave. I hope that you will take today to relax. Rothschild dipped into one half of a formal bow, dropping her head further as if kowtowing. Of course, my lady, Locke hurriedly did the same, only to find that Hester be lifted his head, and kissed him on each cheek in a distinctly European gesture of hospitality, before doing the same to Rothschild. Locke wondered if Rothschild had received the same painful, aggressive burning sensation on her cheeks, or if that was intended as a warning. Enjoy the party, both of you. I find that the star of the show is a bit sterile for my tastes. Hesterby said, referring to the large bug fighting drone set up on a pedestal in the exhibition hall, visible from inside the great hall, and I always did love greeting the best and brightest of meta-humanity, as Locke stepped into the gala proper, observing the rows upon rows of catered tables and flitting groups of elves in gorgeous gowns and suits. He let out a breath that he'd been holding in since he'd first made eye contact. Julia, would you mind finding us a table I need to use the restroom? Rothschild smiled in return. Sure, Vincent. Locke immediately began searching for Larry Coburn, although he spotted Peter McKinley first, in an animated conversation with some of the event's heavily armed security guards. He passed an elegant sign on the way that read security armaments on loan from Ra's Micro Technology. Peter McKinley himself I can't believe I'm meeting you the second floor meanwhile, in the closed off exhibits, Ben circled the museum with a ruthenium polymer coated sack of spy toys and cameras, placing the latter in cubbies and corners like a deranged ninja Santa Claus. As he scaled the tasteful modernist pillar to get a camera in the corner where it met the ceiling, wild card sounded over the encrypted channel on the team's tactical network, Ben, I know it's a bit late to change plans. But could you start doubling up on your coverage Ben stuck the camera in its hiding space, adjusted it to set the adhesive at the right angle, and responded. What? Like just aim for the major angles of transit yeah, said Wildcard, forwarding him a vid feed of a pair of party guests, from the perspective of the camera in the west hallway. The woman was in a stunning skirt coat combo, with the man in a cutting edge Zoe suit. However, 
As both of them turned directly to regard the camera's viewpoint, their faces shifted and blurred. They had both adopted completely neutral, and more worryingly, human, countenances as the woman plucked the camera from its hiding space and crushed it. Dawkins, gasped Ben, they've been following your path and breaking cameras. They're missing three out of every four, but it's still making my job tougher. Ben slipped back down the pillar and propped his head over a banister, looking down at the unlit scale model of a submarine interior in the exhibit beneath him. His invisible face blanched as he spotted a group of would-be utility workers, in slave grey jumpsuits, donning balaclavas and checking a set of submachine guns in the engine room of the submarine. There wasn't a guard in sight, which suggested that either the guard had been paid off or knocked off. Jensen's already arming up. Card. Wild card responded. Calmly. They work for a great, so they're not going to do anything stupid like barge into the main party area. They'll probably start following search protocols and sweeping for Alvarez. As if on cue. One of the jumpsuited men tapped out a few instructions on a cam link, causing every legitimate security camera in their wing to deactivate, while another sighted a guard patrolling on the balcony opposite Ben. The guard collapsed, victim of an obvious stun bolt, as the mercenaries fanned out from the submarine and threes, searching the exhibit for Rowley. Ben caught the wine of night vision goggles activating. I hope for our sake that you're right, he whispered. The expo hall technical difficulties, apologize the virtual hologram of Two D. Its bearded face contorted in a caricature of a sad expression. There has been a malfunction on the lock between the backup ammunition canister and the feeding nozzle. As Ra's state of the art diagnostic system has caught the error, maintenance is going to have the demo up and running in a jiffy I guess they haven't fixed all the bugs, grunted Dervish, in his visored security armor, as he mingled amongst the guests in the expo hall. Wildcard chuckled at the bug joke that he had detected, even if Dervish hadn't made it intentionally. Speaking of bugs, ours are going out. Horizon's got at least a half dozen Dawkins guys on the ground floor, although they seem to be creating a safe perimeter around the expo hall. Jensen's got a ton of mercs on the floor, and more seem to be coming up through the basement. They've compromised the security nexus and have been hacking guards monitors before dropping them. Dervish cursed and turned away from the guests, catching a glimpse of Locke and Peter McKinley in frenzy discussion, sharing stories about Operation Reciprocity. Why the hell didn't you tell me sooner because they've been running quiet so far? Stun bolts and trank rounds. They're not making a big scene, they're waiting for Alvarez. As Dervish moved across the expo hall to get a better look at the closed off parts of the museum, Wildcard barked over the comms, we've got three more contacts. A city garbage truck is pulling up to dispose of some of the party waste, looks like city workers for the most part, anywho. And there's a big black truck parking a block behind the museum, on the other side of the parking garage. There's also a helicopter flying low over the building, although it looks like they have clearance. Maybe spoofed, Locke asked, as he detached from McKinley, heading purposefully back to the main hall where he had spotted Larry Coburn and James Lynch in discussion with each other at the end of one of the tables. You got a view of the truck in a mo, said Wildcard, and the team heard the sound of his binoculars extending over the subvical. Oh, Jesus Christ. Dervish growled, as he forayed into the educational movie theater and spotted three guards crumpled and stacked haphazardly behind the second row of seats. Status Aztecs, groaned wildcard, loaded for bear. Crazy feathered armor suit get-ups, like locks but in better shape. These two twin looking blokes at the front with braided hair, giving orders to the flunkies and wildcard's voice wavered with fear, and that cyborg from back in Seattle. Paired up with one of our willies. They've got one hell of an assault loadout, and it looks like they're making to breach into one of the rear maintenance passages. Dervish half shouted, how the fuck did they make it past the barricade a few party guests turned their heads, and Dervish reassured them, everything is under control, mom. Just some setbacks. We have another problem, noted Locke. The main hall lock forwarded the team the feed from his contacts and earbuds which were optimized enough to pick up elements of Lynch and Coburn's conversation from where he had deliberately situated himself with Rothschild. Lynch asked, his fingers tracing his wine glass as he lowered his voice, and the package Coburn responded, with his characteristic barracuda grin, 
in the basement, the men and the maintenance crew did a hell of a job, I figured no one would check the Ra's angle, said Lynch, with a shrug. And no one did. Speaking of which, you've probably noticed that our mutual friends arranged for the payment, Lynch eyed a few party guests, whom wildcard immediately marked on the tacnet as possible Dawkins, as Coburn downed the last of his own wine, just as planned, said Coburn. It's been a pleasure doing business with you. I'll take my share when this all blows over. As always, responded Lynch, before standing and separating from Coburn, who went in the opposite direction shortly thereafter. Over the cervical, Ben groaned. One of them is Alvarez but they're fucking working together. Coburn is suspect number one so Locke should follow him, said Wildcard. Flatly. Dervish wordlessly. Dervish followed Lynch absentmindedly pushing a few stunned guests aside. The lights flickered and there was a dull thudding noise from elsewhere in the building. As the guests murmured and looked around, Wildcard shouted, as Tetch just breached what the hell did they mean by the package Wildcard highlighted the Ra's drone maintenance team, whom had just finished detaching one of the ammo tanks from the drone in the expo hall, replaced it, and were now taking the spent tank hastily to the maintenance elevator. Wildcard marked them, beneath their disguises, as Barlow, Ice Queen, and Meld, one of Alvarez's runner teams. Either the payment or the artifact is in the Ra's ammo canisters, shouted Wildcard, his composure breaking over the comms. Bend, get after them Bend slipped into the vents, making his way to the top of the elevator hidey hole, as technology making for the main elevator, updated Wildcard, in a frenzy. Jensen moving back downstairs. The helicopter is landing on the roof. It's the German running team. Guests are disappearing, said Locke, as he followed Coburn into the main hall restroom. Dawkins, said Wildcard, breathlessly, as Locke walked up behind Coburn at the urinal. Go loud. Locke stun bolted Coburn in the back of the head before grabbing him by the hair and smashing his face down into the top of the urinal, sending spider webs of shock up the porcelain. Coburn crumpled to the floor with cracked teeth. Although, disappointingly, his face did not change as he fell unconscious. It's Lynch, yelled Locke, holding his hand to his earpiece before regarding a gasping guest at the doorway to the bathroom. Stand back this is a homeland security operation has to be just launched into the sky, said Wildcard. The horizon to the south of Portland is lighting up. The mainstream news channels are reporting some kind of disaster in rural Oregon but details are scattered. The expo hall Sirurg, said Dervish, as he forded through a huge crowd of guests who were beginning to panic, making his way to the expo hall bathroom that Alvarez Lynch had disappeared into, at almost the same time as Coburn had. As he approached, he caught a glimpse of one of the other visored security guards at the bathroom door, glancing around in confusion. Sir get ready to fight, growled Dervish, as he shoved past into the bathroom. All the stalls were closed. One by one. He kicked them open with his raptor legs, exposing, first, two startled elven men, and one elven woman, who seemed to have been in the middle of something with one of the men, and then, at the end of the row, the naked corpse of one of the security guards, propped up atop the toilet with James Lynch's clothing strewn about him, back in the expo hall, the security guard that Dervish had regarded prior was marked on wild cards cameras as he vaulted effortlessly up the pedestal that Ra's drone was on unscrewed the recently installed ammo canister, and then began a headlong sprint across the expo hall for the maintenance exit that lead to the stalling garbage truck. The garbage men poured into the expo hall through the same exit, producing concealed submachine guns as their faces blurred. One of the Dawkins operatives yelled, as a few of the guests ferried out with their own concealed weapons to join their ranks. Nobody move the main hall what the hell is happening, asked Rothschild, her hand over a holdout pistol strapped to her thigh, as Locke came sprinting back to their table. Julia Locke began, a pair of double doors separating the main hall from the closed off fossils exhibit fell into multiple pieces as the cyber zombies blades tore through it, revealing the Aztec tag team to the screaming guests. One of the braided men behind the zombie barked. Matin Felix Ramirez Matin Rodrigo Alvarez Cogel Artifacto Wildcard said, through Locke's earpiece right as Locke yelled it to Rothschild. Run the expo hall Dawkins barely had time to react as Dervish plowed through the two garbage men at the four, 
snapping both clean in half with a snicker snack of his cyber blades as he continued, without losing momentum, into the alleyway with the garbage truck. Or, rather, the alleyway that had held the garbage truck, which was now speeding out to meet the freeway with a fancy sports car behind it, faster than a garbage truck had any right to move, as a rocket propelled grenade flashed out from the sports car and raced for Dervish. He ducked low and blasted off for the street in front of the building, seeking the parking lot. The missile missed him by inches, crashing into the side of the museum as alarms began to sound. The parking lot gunfire was sounding loud and clear from the museum, but Wildcard could scarcely hear it as he drifted up the circular parking garage, maintaining as high a speed as his high and eye could without careening through the wall and off into the night sky. He pulled up behind the van and, leaving his engine running, dashed out the door and unlocked the back of the clunky vehicle. Everything was still there, although he found what he was looking for in particular, locksmith spec armor and LMG, nestled amid studels of other tantalizing but unnecessary items of gear. With a grunt of exertion, he hefted both haphazardly into the back seat of the super getaway high and die, and then jumped back into his car as the tacnut registered dervish reaching the bottom of the parking structure. Bystanders, those who had caught on to what had happened early, were rushing for their cars, and regarded Wildcard as he blasted back down the parking structure with terror. As Wildcard passed Dervish while he was racing up from the third floor on blazing skimmer discs, the two exchanged a curt nod. Felix, said Wildcard, slipping and using Locke's real name, you're getting extracted. Meet in front of the west, one of the windows of the expo hall blasted outward in a shower of melting metal and liquid glass courtesy of a certain custom superheated ash spell. Locke, bloodied and battered but alive in his ruined suit, launched bodily outside and pulled into a tuck and roll on the pavement. Locke sprinted for the car, running on adrenaline and fear as two Aztec troops chased after him. With an immense bang, one of the Aztecs hit pavement with a clean hole through his torso, courtesy of Dervish reaching his sniper rifle at the van. Nice cover, Dervish, yelled Wildcard, as he propped his VAR out of his driver's side window and began hosing down everything in the general direction of the other, forcing the soldier to take cover behind a planter. Dawkins is closing in on me, gasped Bend, over the subvicle. One of them got a shot in, nothing serious, just the leg. Jensen swooped in and blindsided them, but, but Alvarez's runners are doing the handoff on the roof right now. And I can't stop them. As Locke vaulted the roof of the Hyundai and circled into the shotgun seat, Dervish said, from his sniper perch, stop them, I told you I can't, stop them, repeated Dervish. I couldn't, said Ben, his voice breaking up. Bend, said Locke. As the super getaway high and I did a donut over the grass lawn and then flashed off to the 405 freeway. Do it. Ben sobbed. Yeah. Okay. So much for pacifism. 20 seconds later, Wildcard saw in his rear view mirror as the roof of the museum exploded. Suddenly, thousands of our bulletins leapt into action across the periphery of his vision. The terror alert had been sounded. The two was under martial law. The roof the roof. Now a crater of wickedly exposed rebar and precariously hanging concrete, was host to a small race of swords, as Bend, caught under a large hunk of steel, spotted Quake in much the same position. Next to Bend, the merc named Barlow, son legs, sputtered and grasped for his gun, clearly in shock. Bend also registered movements at the periphery of the roof where the pipe bomb hadn't done as much damage, likely the remnants of the German team's gunners. Quake screamed bloody murder as he sighted Bend and his helicopter, relatively unscathed, appeared overhead, shining spotlights on both runners. Bend desperately rolled over, catching and cutting himself badly on the steel girder as he flopped behind a collapsed pillar. An immense, unrestrained shockwave blasted out from Quake, nearly missing Bend and sending Barlow catapulting, screaming in terror, into the night sky, not wasting any time. Ben popped around the other side of his cover and loosed a thunderbolt burst, but the shots went wide. He was swiftly driven back behind cover by a hail of fire, and recognized with dismay that he had probably killed very few of the six other Germans. The second story elevator ding behind Ben, and he gasped in terror as he spotted two Aztecs at the door, guns at the ready, but then the struts holding the elevator to the wall suddenly burst at the seams and flew in opposite directions. 
causing the elevator to peel free of its structure and drop to the basement with a horrifying crunch. Standing in the center of the rooftop crater, Quake began laughing madly, blood freely streaming from his tear ducts and nostrils as he loose destruction spell after destruction spell, living up to his name, please, grunted Ben, his broken ribs and perforated legs searing in pain, I need backup, anyone, give me 5 minutes, said Dervish, from across the street, I can't see any of the gunmen with my rifle through all the smoke, but if you give me time to grab my armor I can make it over there, Dervish, coughed bend, as he stumbled for another broken wall as Quake flowed through the one he was hiding behind, I don't have that long, 3 minutes, said Dervish, as he tore up the upholstery in the van, Ben's voice was serene, Dervish, he said, I am going to die, Dervish stared longingly at his America San Power Armor, instead, he donned his camo pants and his Yukus Veterans Administration armor jacket, almost reverently, he tied the tattered American flag that was crumpled in his pocket across his forehead, making a headband. Hold the fuck on, you pansy. Dervish slid his anti-material rifles bandolier over his left shoulder and his shotguns over his right. His skimmer discs activated as he slowly lifted off the ground and picked up speed, boosting up the cylindrical ramp and banking against the side barriers to keep himself balanced. His voice softened as he finished. I'm coming to save you. Bend watched in awe as a shooting star launched from the roof of the parking structure, alighting in the sky over the street by the German helicopter. The adept in the helicopter screamed in panic, as the streak in the sky passed. Herr Americ Quake turned to the sky in time to witness a series of skyward flashes, like manna falling from heaven, and then three at slugs blasted through his ribcage from the shoulder blades down, dropping him. He hadn't finished falling to his knees when Dervish crashed into him, wrapped her legs first, reducing Quake to a red particulate paste and a stream of gibbs. One of the coughing Germans yelled, booking for the boxy protrusion that was once the roof access stairs. Stru and Dervish stood up and spun in a fraction of a second, launching an underbarrel grenade from his grenade launcher at the open firing platform that the German adept stood in in the helicopter. The adept caught the grenade and, with a pinwheeling motion, Hucked it back at Dervish, missing by a short distance and blowing a hole clean through the floor of the second floor into the first floor. Ramping up the side of the crater, Dervish grabbed one of the Germans by the neck and used him to soak covering fire from his teammates, before pitching the unfortunate sod off the roof and firing, in quick succession, another two underbarrel grenades. As the adept flung the first into the night sky, the second sailed past him, leaving him unable to react when the grenade debristed, blowing out the side doors of the helicopter and shredding the adept. The helicopter pulled into a tailspin, its minigun spinning to life. As the helicopter alit and loaded a short burst of fire into Dervish's last known position, a small white dragon wearing what appeared to be full military spec barding flashed out of the air from the direction of downtown, a lit on the nose of a chopper, and breathed a cone of high pressure fire directly through the windshield. The chopper died in the air before violently smashing into the middle of the street below as the drake bailed off into the air again. Gentlemen, said Gunter Lehman, over the team's comms, my partner, 8.49 pm, the 23rd of February, 2074. The 405 freeway, Portland, Titanga stay inside and evacuate downtown Portland if at all possible. Do not call emergency lines at this time unless you have a medical crisis. Response teams are forthcoming and all citizens are advised to cooperate to the fullest possible. Wildcard switched off the radio, Tanati other sun god, or at least an aspect of him, sat behind lock and wildcard as the two runners practically flew along the freeway. Magic and maintenance causing their supercar to hold together even when approaching speeds better reserved for aircraft. As Locke donned his gear from the shotgun seat, making sure that all relevant locks, buckles, and seals were arranged correctly, Wildcard's Nexus ran scans on passing vehicles as they blew by. Most grid-linked vehicles have been locked down, explained Wildcard, as Locke arranged his spirit-binding materials along the dashboard and began quietly chanting in Aztlana Spanish. Wildcard jerked to avoid a police barricade in the midst of being set up, sending the cops scattering from their cars. So we can peg the grey SUVs that are passing by as Jinson or the like. We passed an APC 60 seconds back as it was hitting the opposite on-ramp. Here's hoping it's two guys, 
because with the numbers Jinsen is throwing at this thing we need a little more firepower on our side, that is not on our side, responded Locke, as the binding materials glowed with the auras of their constituent spirits. Tis enough on our side to count, clucked Wildcard, although he had to avoid the instinct to slam on the brakes as the silhouette of a massive gunship passed overhead, far too low to the ground to be safe. Bloody hell was that Locke peered over his shoulder. Looked like Graz. Couldn't have been, said Wildcard, as he adjusted his steering wheel and picked up speed again. Raz isn't involved, maybe they are now, said Locke, tightening the seal on his helmet. Coming up on the target, Wildcard and Locke watched as the Dawkins operatives and the sports car escort exchanged fire with a van full of Jinsen mercenaries. Jinsen's getting the worst of it, observed Wildcard, bloke in the truck with a big gun, let's change that, said Locke summoning up his fire spirit and sending it after the truck. As the top of the truck lit to flame, to the distant screams of the operative thereupon, the Jinsen van flipped and careened into the center divider, leaving the runners as the only aggressive contact. Wildcard barked, tightening his hands on the wheel, as we planned. Lock Lock grimaced as he called up his water spirit, in the form of Tlaloc, the rain goddess, to help him maintain his illusions. This was going to suck. As the supercar continued to catch up with the sports car, Locke placed his hands on the armrests and gripped harshly, steadying himself as he focused. A perfect double of the Hyundai split off from Wildcard even as, with the assistance of the water spirit, the Hyundai itself was rendered invisible. As Wildcard accelerated even further, straining to steer as he pulled alongside the flaming truck, the Dawkins gunner sighted the illusion with a rocket, finger hovering over the trigger. You're not going to like this, said Wildcard. Locke nodded with a pained grunt as Wildcard opened the sunroof. Try not to vomit. Locke nodded again before Wildcard threw the car into a tailspin and slammed into reverse, utilizing the momentum provided by the spirit's movements to slide in front of Dawkins' considerably slower car. Locke clambered up to brace his torso against the hood of the car, thankful for the fact that the armor was between him and hundreds of miles per hour's worth of air current. Post haste, he slammed his bipod down, flicked the safety on his LMG, and squeezed the trigger. It wasn't an elegant use of the weapon so much as spray and pray, but as the west wind came apart at the seams under a sustained stream of heavy caliber apps rounds, accuracy was a secondary concern. The driver died almost instantly, taking easily a dozen bullets and most of the windshield, and as the car steered erratically, Locke's line of fire carved across both left wheels causing the car to enter a dramatic sideways flip and, in the process, catapult the gunner straight into the ground. The rocket-propelled grenade sailed into the night sky, off to ruin somebody else's night. Without skipping a beat, Wildcard spun to get behind the truck again, causing Locke to clank against the roof and curse loudly, and as a man in a garbage man's outfit leaned out the passenger side window with an assault rifle, Locke blew his last fire spirit service. Just like a month ago at the Blue Bohemian, the accident effect caused the internal mechanisms of the garbage truck to go awry, and the tall, unbalanced vehicle began to wobble, steering dangerously close to the right edge of the freeway as the assailants merged onto the 5 freeway and started through the fashion industrial district. Wildcard pulled to the left as the assault rifle began peppering shots at where the car had been, giving Locke an opening to begin thumping away at the truck's wheels with his LMG. The weakening was exactly what he had required to do lasting damage, and the truck tilted dangerously onto its left side. Overcorrecting, the driver swerved to the right, and Wildcard and Locke watched with more satisfaction than they would have liked to admit as the garbage truck plowed clean off the freeway, crashing through the brick and mortar separators and falling into the streets below. There was a resounding screech and then a deafening crash as the truck skidded along the road, knocked a parked car aside and then came to a stop in the fountain in front of an office park. Wasting no time, Wildcard took the next exit and doubled back, pulling out to the front of the plaza as murmuring bystanders looked on and took pictures with their comlinks. Magnified by each individual comlink, the Titerror alert system continued its tinny whine in the background. The truck was belching forth great plumes of smoke into the sky from its ruined engine block, and the water from the crushed fountain flowed around it and dribbled into the street. 
The rubbernecking elven crowd didn't panic, but just watched as Wildcard and Bent stepped out of their car, weapons in tow, advancing on the office park. Given their distinctive armor choices, it was too surreal to take seriously, and the way that they moved with seemingly no self-awareness that they were being caught on hundreds of cameras added to the effect. It was like a reality TV stunt. As Wildcard swapped out his drum of apps for a drum of X6, he gestured with his left hand for Locke to flank. Locke circled the wreck, LMG shouldered with a new box of apps attached. The front cabinet was a mess of blood and broken glass with the broken corpse of the gunman in the garbage man's outfit lolling out, face down in the water. Locke picked up the pace and rounded the vehicle as Wildcard whistled loudly, the sound coming out unnerving and unnatural through his mask filters. A man in a suit of museum security armor, clutching a very dented Ras Fabcast ammo tank, slowly crawled away from the wreck, trailing thin streams of blood. He noticed Wildcard and Locke belatedly, although as he pulled his sidearm, Wildcard rushed up and kicked it out of his hand before following up with another kick to his head, dislodging his security helmet. He looked identical to the dead guard from the museum bathroom, plus or minus a broken nose. Wildcard shouted, in full view of the astonished onlookers, Are you Rodrigo Alvarez? The guard stammered, I know, I'm not are you Rodrigo Alvarez? Wildcard locked his VAR into his hip pad brace and brandished it, its massive ammo drum brushing against his knee pads. The guard's face melted and reformed like plastic under a fire, swiftly taking on the form of Rodrigo Alvarez that the team had seen in Schwarzkopf's dossier. Despite his generically handsome Ken doll features, Wildcard noted that his nose was still broken. Okay, yes. I'm Rodrigo Alvarez. But if you let me live I have a lot of sway with Horizon. I'm sure I can arrange to double whatever you're receiving. Wildcard and Locke looked at each other. Even though they couldn't see each other's faces through their respective helmets, the understanding was implicit. Sorry mate, said Wildcard, as he dug his feet into the ground, widened his stance, and leveled his gun at Alvarez. You fucked with Lothwick. Alvarez's screams were cut short even as the crowd finally began screaming themselves, spurred by the blaring clatter of the Havar being loosed into Alvarez's torso. Locke took up a firing stance shortly after Wildcard gripped his LMG, and also began pouring round after round into Alvarez. The app's rounds punched through meat and bone into pavement as the explosive round scattered what little remained to the wind, turning Alvarez, over the course of approximately 145 bullets, into liquid. A few brave, or foolish, bystanders remained, still recording on their phones, as Wildcard and Locke furiously clicked their empty guns, breathing heavily through their mask filters. Sirens closed in as both men slowly stood. Let's get the fuck out of here. Locke groaned, spent. First things first, said Wildcard, as he hefted the ammo canister. A sense this, Locke stared at it for a brief moment before moving to help Wildcard carry it. Help me get it to the car. Wildcard asked, so it's the artifact better. As Wildcard began pulling the car back into the streets of Titangaya, Locke opened up communications. Bend, Dervish, the package is the one on your end. We'll be moving to reinforce you as soon as we can. There was an agonizing wait, filled with static. Tis set up barricades all over the district, barked Dervish. Can't get back through in the car. Wildcard let out a sigh of relief. Actually, we were going to check on the status of our miracle. From behind the two runners, a police megaphone announced, Pull over, after we shake the cops, 8.53pm, the 23rd of February, 2074, the Museum of Science and Industry, downtown Portland, Titanga Dervish's shotgun hammered away at the broken statue that the remaining three German mercs were using for cover as he slowly advanced, his Sibiris scanning for movement, Bend limped behind him, Thunderbolt raised, as he tried to keep his eyes on what was behind Dervish. The gesture was tactically useless. Dervish could see in 360 degrees, but Bend appreciated the sense of safety it gave him, especially with how conflicted his emotions were. Bend, said Dervish, purposefully, and Bend whirled, planting a stench spell behind the German's cover. As the three black armored mercs stumbled out, gagging, Dervish boosted forward, slamming his blades through the chests of the first two. The third turned, in a panic, 
but couldn't move fast enough as Dervish pulled both spurs inward, carving through his back and sending him ragballing across the floor. Wild cards not on ops, grunted Ben. Next attack could come from anywhere. Windows, said Dervish, before grabbing Ben bodily around the waist and dragging him down behind a collapsed ceiling support beam. Automatic fire crashed through the street side windows before, with the distant clanking of hydraulic jacks. Four masked gunmen leapt through the windows. Dervish popped up from behind the beam and boosted into the first merc before they could even get their bearings, punching both blades through his chest and sending him careening back out into the street. As the Sammy whirled to regard the other three, he caught the whine of a minigun across the hall with his sonar and threw himself to the ground, getting a face full of broken glass for his troubles. The three remaining mercs had a few moments to fire an erratic stream of bullets, some at Dervish and some at the newcomer, before all three were carved apart by the automatic cannon, which also punched through the second story wall they were situated against, causing another section of the ceiling to collapse and join the crater. Give me Felix Ramirez, announced the cyborg, its human-like facade filled with pockmarks and bullet holes, as it advanced into the room from the main hall stairs. God bent threw himself off the second story balcony and into a hang over the expo hall, adhering to the lower wall as bullets raced overhead. Damn it the main body of the AS technology force, Benz noted, was engaged in a fighting retreat upstairs, being pushed out of the main and expo halls by a renewed force of Jinsen reinforcements. If Horizon was still here, he wasn't seeing them, scampering on all fours to behind the dead German's cover. Dervish grabbed the ammo canister that held the artifact to his chest. He boosted with his skimmers to under a collapsed section of roof, hoping the break line of sight, when the canister was yanked from his grasp mid-slide. It hovered into the air, slowly levitating across the roof and flying towards the parking structure. Fucking Horizoner across the street, yelled Dervish. They've got a mage I got it, responded Ben, as a spirit that resembled a Buddhist warrior monk done up in prayer beads and shawl, burst into the air and physically grasped the canister, wrestling it back to the ground. The spirit only made it halfway before El Terminator leveled its minigun. Ben vaulted back onto the second story, pulling his taser and sprinting towards the cyborg. No, no no no, there was a cacophonous boom as a tungsten carbide shell the size of a coffee mug slammed into El Terminator's chest, causing the cyborg to lift bodily off its feet and tumble down the staircase catching a few Aztecs with it. A few Jins and Mercs vaulted up from the expo hall to the second story, guns brandished, as Ben leapt, grabbed the canister, and was spirited back under the collapsed roof section by Dervish. What now, moaned Ben, as a garish red, white and blue gunship settled into a jump jet hover in a slow circle around the museum. As a bomb-faced icon appeared in our space in front of the gunship's cockpit, a familiar voice broadcast on the local R. Attention terrorist Chucklefox, yelled Twody, we are here to extract the prized prototype that you have recklessly endangered with your flailing shenanigan. Ras Micro Technology and its subsidiaries officially disavow any agenda separate from the extraction of said prototype, oh, god, whimpered Ben. Ras enjoys a position as an official contractor to the T military. Anyone who does not cooperate will be shot until dead. You will receive no warnings. One of the Jinsen mercs launched a shoulder-mounted missile at the gunship, which yawed obscenely, deployed chaff, and then returned fire with its main cannon, blasting the offending merc in two. I see that we're doing this the hard way, then. Fine by me Jinsen and Aztec alike dashed for cover as the gunship began indiscriminately firing on everything it could see, continuing to ruin what little remained of the roof as Dervish and Bend leapt down through the grenade hole onto the first floor. Above in the sky, Wildcard's helicopter decelerated in close proximity to the Rath gunship, ushered to speed by a great form guidance spirit that Schwarzkopf had left bound to the helicopter with one service. Bomb-headed icons appeared on every monitor as Twody breezed into the helicopter's systems. Hee hee it's the guy from the Christmas party, laughed Twody. What's up Wildcard noticed that, despite the jovial tone, the gunship had achieved a missile lock in a matter of microseconds. Just trying to save Dervish, is all, said Wildcard, curtly. Funny, because you just stepped into Ra's jurisdiction, 
given a stipulating clause in the loan contract to the Museum of Science and Industry, giggled Twody. So how about you sit this one out no can do, said Wildcard, as he glanced back at Locke, nervous. Twody audibly pondered this, making mmmmm thinking noises. Tell you what, replacement, said Twody, as the gunship settled onto the roof and deployed a vanguard of four men in Firewatch Millspec and two modified to hell steel lynxes, I'll race ya. You like races, right wildcard remained silent as Twody continued, this time over the local R, shoot everything that moves, gentleman first one to dervish gets the prize as wildcard systems were returned to him, he pulled out into the airspace over the river, and immediately hailed Bend and Dervish. Ditch the package, you two razes after you downstairs in the main hall. Dervish regarded the panicking kangaroo at his heels as he dropped the headless body of a Jinsen Merc. That's the problem, we already did. Well, where the fuck is it? Then a flying Aztec shaman in full eagle warrior regalia blasted out of the roof, arcing over the Raz gunship. Sorry, grunted Dervish. Put it down to kill these guys. Lock, yelled Wildcard. Locke called up a flaming serpent and sent it coiling after the mage, only to watch it get stunbolted out of the sky by the combined force of the Aztec mage and the Horizon mage on the adjacent rooftop, with an angry growl. Wildcard loosed a missile at the Horizon team, causing the Dawkins operatives to scatter and flee further down into the parking structure as the parked cars erupted, bleeding from the nose. Locke cracked the door of the helicopter and tried to sight the mage for a spell manually. It was suddenly knocked directly up into the ceiling of the helicopter, struck by something that carried through the roof and mercifully missed the rotors. Locke flopped back into the helicopter with a massive hole through his lower ribcage, sputtering and retching blood. Locke is down, yelled Wildcard. What the fuck was that another projectile blasted through the air at immense speed, barely missing the helicopter. Wildcard identified the silhout of the willy which was carrying a huge magnetic railgun in its cold titanium hands. Not wasting a moment, Wildcard spun in the air and launched a barrage of missiles at it, reducing it to parts in a crater in the street even as it fired off one last shot, blasting a hole clean from nose to tail of the helicopter and causing the machinery within to screech in agony. Half of the monitors went unresponsive in an instant. I don't think I can stay aloft much longer, said Wildcard increasing altitude to distance himself from the fight. Standing in the compartment, he let the auto-stabilized take over long enough to produce the Dockwagon Biomonitor bracelet from his wrist and clasp it around locks. That shaman is on you. The downside is to not just remotely rigging your chopper, taunted Toadie's voice, through wild cards are. Shut up, copper. Below, Drake Prime 1 flashed through the sky and tackled the Aztec mage out of the air, eviscerating him and retrieving the canister. It cut low towards the roof until the Horizon mage, now running across the street with his team, blasted it with a power bolt, causing it to drop the canister in the museum wreckage by the submarine exhibit as it struggled to stay aloft. Although the Dawkins operatives moved to intercept, an enfilade of fire from three Jinsen mercs at the drop site had one of them kissing pavement and the rest scrambling for cover. As Dervish Jack jumped back upstairs to get a better vantage point and Ben, back in elf form, tack cloak to circle around the battlefield and retrieve the canister, Firewatch hit the main hall stairs. The pride and joy of Ra's hardware, each operative had a different experimental weapon, a next gen alpha, a railgun, a flamethrower and a laser cannon, and the perfectly coordinated fire turned the unprepared Jinsen who were pouring into the room into so many colorful corpses. As a remaining AS technology squad rounded the entrance from the expo hall, sighting Firewatch, the dwarf with the laser swept across them and sliced them all of the legs, dropping them into a screaming pile. The troll with the flamethrower ran up and hosed down the writhing, screaming bodies. Dropping the boot of his matching power armor on anything that kept moving, the human at the front, with the alpha, announced through his helmet Vox, AZT has left the building with a whore of the four operatives settled in a breaching position at the expo hall, approaching the drone, Dervish wisely resolved not to drop down and fuck with that, instead, he boosted to the pockmarked floor above the expo hall, in what was once the offices of the building. As two shell shock mercenaries reacted to his presence by popping up out of cover from behind a conference table, he instinctively vaulted up, ricocheted down low to crash through the table as the gun started blazing, 
and then severed both men's legs before finishing them off with rapid spur blows as they fell. Huffing but unharmed, he contacted Ben, whom his Tacnut registered as being outside by the expo hall windows. Bend, do you think you can get another spirit through there to raise the package to me absolutely, responded Ben, breathless. I just need a, there was a roar of gunfire as Raz breached into the expo hall, taking on the scattered remnants of the mercenaries. Distraction, Dervish watched through his sonar as the package was lifted up to the balconies above the submarine exhibit. He dashed to the first available one and reached out, taking it from the hands of the Buddhist spirit. The canister's protective casing was partially worn away, revealing a large oblong object with a scaly texture inside. He made sure not to pay too much attention to it, in keeping with Schwarzkopf's wishes. Not that he had much time to contemplate what he'd seen, as Horizon had circled around when Raz engaged the mercs and were now running up the stairs. Somewhere along the line, they'd loaded into full mil-spec armor which wasn't a gamble that Dervish wanted to take when he had the unprotected artifact in tow. Out in the back alley, where the garbage truck was, Guntilliman said, patching into the team's comms. Hurry, without any better directions, Dervish fled for the window nearest to the alleyway. As he passed beneath gaps in the ceiling, he made sure to stay out of sight of the circling Raz gunship. Higher above, he registered that a Dockwagon helicopter was hovering next to the team's own helicopter which was a dire sign. As he burst out through a window, shielding the artifact with his body, Dervish found Drake Prime 1. Or at least, he guessed that the bleach blonde and mostly naked human form standing next to a ruined set of dragon-sized power armor fit the bill. Give the artifact here, said the Drake. Aggressively, Dervish calmly leveled his shotgun at the wounded Drake. The artifact goes to Schwarzkopf and whoever he vouches for. I need to call him up first. I am Drake Prime, shouted the Drake, although he put his hands up in a sign of surrender. I am the Hand of Lothwir and we work for Schwarzkopf, said Dervish, as, amidst wrath gunfire and the blaring of alert sirens, he visibly called up Mr. Johnson in his pan. If he vouches for you, you're gold, the Drake scowled, bearing sharp, half-shifted teeth in a roar. Can it, as the phone continued to ring. There was a sonic boom in the distance as the silhouette of a massive orange dragon appeared on the horizon. Bearing fast, Dervish watched, dispassionately, as the phone continued to make stock ring 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 noises. He continued to watch as the dragon circled the Wrath gunship as if in warning, flew directly overhead, and then dropped to the ground next to Drake Prime 1, immediately shifting into the familiar auburn haired form of Hesterby. Her ball gown was a little out of sorts. Regardless, the drake immediately ceased menacing Dervish and threw himself into a face down kowtow in front of a great. Dervish, said Hesterby, her voice cool. Excellent. I'm here to escort the artifact to safety. There was a pause. Hesterby looked expectantly at Dervish, who merely continued to hold his gun and repeated. The artifact goes to Schwarzkopf and whoever he vouches for. I am Hesterby, repeated Hesterby, clearly expecting the statement to make a difference. I am America San, responded Dervish, balancing the package in his left elbow to make a phone ringing gesture with his left hand. The ambient temperature began to heat and loose elements of garbage began to come aflame as has to be quietly regarded Dervish for another 12 agonizing seconds. Dervish, said the familiar voice of Schwarzkopf. I'm going to cut to the chase. Johnson, said Dervish. Hesterby wants the egg. There was a pause. Well bloody well give it to her then, Dervish frown. You're sure that has to be can be trusted with it has to be's calm smile faltered entirely as Drake Prime 1 gasped aloud. Over the phone, Schwarzkopf responded. Simply, yes, but it's Lothwiz, said Dervish. Dervish, said Schwarzkopf, please hand the artifact to Hesterby post haste. Any further speculation into why my employer trusts Hesterby with this matter should be discouraged, lest I have to eat you. Dervish gingerly held out the broken remnants of the canister containing the artifact, and Hesterby snatched it away from him primly, or rather as primly as one can snatch anything. Pleasure doing business with you, mom, said Dervish, extending a hand to shake. After a moment, Hesterby reached out to accept the hand. Likewise. The rubber shock pads on Dervish's palm bubbled and produced smoke as they melted. Even, 
though it's been years and I have no idea what became of RMH. I'd like to imagine that he's happy to have his draw faggotry adorning the final thread of this tale, right at the moment of Dervish's transcendence, whereupon he became Dervish Claws and circled the world, giving exactly no fucks to all the boys and girls. Let your comments flow free, like the spirit of liberty. Please deal with the remaining enemies on sight, said has to be, addressing both Dervish and the Drake as she wove a crackling stream of magic in the air in front of her. I trust that you can manage this with some rudimentary magical support. As both Dervish and the Drake's wounds closed instantaneously, Dervish found himself hovering a few feet above the ground without the aid of his skimmers. Testing the limits of his motion, he swiftly found that he could move around through the air, very, very fast. Oh, hell yes, said Dervish, rocketing into the sky, only partially in response to Hesterby. As he dove back down, arcing through the sky like Orc Superman, he focused his enhanced senses on the Horizon Tac team on the second floor. Horizon's point man was the first to go, as Dervish landed directly on top of him punching him clean through floor and then carrying him down in a pillar driver into the concrete flooring above the basement. As the professional company men sighted him, he shot back upstairs faster than they could perceive, knocking the team's mage into the sky with a shriek before shouldering his anti-material rifle and firing straight up, silencing the screams. As the mage rained down about their shoulders, the remaining four Horizon troops unloaded their mags into Dervish. Dervish was as surprised as they were to find that none of the app's rounds breached his skin. Oh, fuck yes, like a twig, the Dawkins tag team's morale broke. The man in front yelled, goddammit, run laughing ecstatically, Dervish chased them down as they fled down the stairs, pitching them through walls, floors, and ceilings, multiple times if necessary, like metahuman ragdolls. Dervish circled the building in instants each time slaying one of the few remaining mercenaries effortlessly, adding mass to the utter piles of bodies that had begun to stack up around the museum. It was equal parts hubris and confidence that led him to simply hover directly into the expo hall, in full view of the firewatch squad that had camped out there. Dervish settled before them in his pristine muscle-bound glory, American flag headband fluttering as if daring them to attack. Lasers, flames, bullets, he could take it all at this point, he had the buff spells of a great dragon behind him. Instead, the human in the lead just yelled back to his team. Secure the prototype dervish blinked as the firewatch squad surrounded him and then settled into firing positions. Facing outward, the troll in the rear put his hand flat on dervish's back and began gently pushing him forward, towards the stairs, as the team of operators combat shuffled in sync. You, what? The human glanced back from his position at the point of the formation and said, through his polarized faceplate, we're securing the prototype, Dervish, still being effortlessly pushed along in his low hover, pointed at the completely scrapped Raz robot. Prototypes over there, dingus, negative, sir, said the man at the head of the firewatch squad, the prototype next gen super soldier, project name America San, Dervish pointed at himself. I'm the prototype the fourth team member with the railgun, a human woman under her power armor by the looks of her, laughed through her own vocoder. With all due respect, sir, you didn't think we were really putting this much effort into retrieving a bug spraying robot as Wildcard settled his helicopter down near to the carnage, directly next to the dockwagon chopper that was currently keeping Locke alive, if in critical condition, Twody's voice sounded over his comms. I win the race. As Bend limped out of the building, hobbling over to the helicopter, a tank flanked on either side by Apts trundled into the courtyard, offloading Tiberines who began hurrying into the building. A few of the elven soldiers eyed the runners warily, but a yell from their commander at the rear of the formation had them jogging back into position. Where's Dervish Wildcard, whose mask was off for the first time in over 36 hours, pointing at the Raz gunship, which had settled into the cratered remains of the roof. He found some new mates and is getting acquainted. We'll get along without him, he's hoping for a quiet ride back to Seattle, joked Bend, although there wasn't much mirth behind the joke. Wildcard just nodded in agreement, his plasticine face barely expressing. There was a beat before Bend spoke again. How's he doing Wildcard grimaced? Likely he'll live. They've got him on life support, although our team Aztec is going to be needing some new organs before all this is over. 
Ben looked glumly at the dock wagon transport. Are we fielding the costs actually? Said Wildcard. With a half smile. We're just deducting it from his share. Ben scowled. Don't ever let the Azzy know that I'm defending him on this one. But that messed up. For all we know he's going to need to keep up treatment for years. And that's going to really eat away at the money he made off this whole thing. Wildcard placed his armored gauntlet on Ben's shoulder. Bend, said Wildcard. I don't think you fully appreciate how large his share is. Noon, the 26th of February, 2074. The Faulty Bar, Seattle Metroplex. You cause the Faulty Bar was popular, even at noon. Abe Heap had gathered a clutch of would-be runners, teenagers and street thugs, mostly, around the bar, and was telling them a lurid tale of the olden days of katanas and trench coats. Pink mohawks and non-wireless matrices. A scrawny moppet who was almost certainly too young to drink nursed her beer. Seemingly more terrified at the prospect of a dial-up internet connection than she was of insect spirits or shed him. And speaking of which, the old Sammy said, as Ben stepped into the doorway in a muted green suit, carrying a small briefcase. This is a man who's seen it all. The wannabes gathered around the bar parted and allowed Ben access. Some of them clapping him on the back but most keeping a respectful distance. And hid from most of it, said Ben, earning a small smattering of laughs from his audience. Hey Abe, is Brianna in middle of a telephone call, said Abe, but nodded towards the back office anyway. Feel free to let her know you're here. Hey Abe, said a large troll, from the corner of the room, as Ben stepped behind the bar. What the dreck is a telephone Ben took the small flight of stairs up to Brianna's office. Finding that the rest of the team was already there. Dervish, in his tight black suit, bore an Ra's pin on his lapel, identical to the one worn by Twody and Bradford Nice. Wildcard was in his usual pinstripes, although the suit in question was particularly expensive looking and he sported a platinum luxury watch on one wrist. Locke was perhaps the least fashionably dressed, but that was understandable given that he'd been in surgery for the better part of a week. He sat in an armchair in the corner of the office, dressed in a simple tweed jacket over a patterned t-shirt, and smiled weakly at Ben as he entered. Brianna McCreary was as harried looking as always, brushing her scarlet bangs out of her freckled face with her left hand as she clutched one of her 15 or so cum links with her right. No, I'm sorry, Senator. My boys have somehow gotten it into their heads that they're retiring. Yes, I know that you prefer to work with known quantities. But I can make referrals. No I'm sorry we couldn't agree on this. Goodbye. Brianna made a frustrated huffing noise as she flopped down into her office chair. Initiating a little spin that caused her to regard each of the team members in turn. You boys have put me in one hell of a bind. Sorry, Brianna. Said Locke. We're not ungrateful. But that last job was something of a wake up call. Brianna looked at Locke conspiratorially. You know the whole thing is totally classified I can't even ask anybody. All the channels are hush hush. The media seems to think that Sirug was to blame for those industrial parks that got lit up in the south of Oregon. But nobody is taking responsibility for whatever the hell happened to the Museum of Science and Industry. Ben Crin. Speaking of which. Continued Brianna. As she turned on a trade recording behind her desk. Maybe one of you can explain to me what the hell this is. The image was of Dervish and Bradford Nice in a press room, wearing matching suits and speaking into microphones. We're given exemplary service in Portland, we are proud to adopt Garrett Jordan, known to many out there as Dervish or America San, formerly into the Raz family. Although Mr. Jordan was not aware of it at the time, lied Nice, through his shameless movie star teeth, he was actually a test bed for a number of now confirmed experimental Raz products. Naturally, his utter dominance of the shadow run world should be considered a statement as to the quality of the tech. There was an uproar from the reporters. Mr. Jordan, said one of the reporters, what do you say to allegations by the AS technology rep that your origins actually lie with proprietary tech developed by their company Dervish spoke into the mic, clearly coached. While it's true that there has been some cross-pollination between Raz and AS technology think tanks in the past, the frank fact of the matter is that those accusations are baseless. My past is purely mercenary, aside from my underlying loyalties to Raz. All of my interactions with AS technology were strictly on a contracting basis. Yes, agreed nice. Fundamentally one can't account for every influence in a wide standing. 
far-reaching project like this. As always, the men and women of AS Technology Cyber Labs are an inspiration, but we here at RAS prize hard American work and ingenuity. Garrett can look forward to a star record of service in Night Air and Firewatch, fighting enemies to peace around the globe, and also, said Dervish, leaning into the mic, my own reality TV show, coming in the next fiscal quarter. It's about me fighting crime and terrorists. Nice spat up a little bit of his glass of water, although he swiftly recovered composure. Yes. That, that was a thing we certainly had planned for all you fans out there. I'm going to have a sidekick. He's a knight errant officer who acts as the letter of the law good cop to my renegade. I picked him personally. Nice mouth what and moved to take Dervish's mic from him as Brianna stopped the clip. Everything in that video is true, said Dervish, deadpan, as he stood in the corner of the room, so that a Brianna stood up, her expression hurt, no notice all of you just going your separate ways everyone nodded and grunted their agreement, if it helps, said Ben, we put together a little gift to let you know how much all this time together meant to us, Brianna looked like she was trying to hold back tears as Ben lifted the small briefcase, placed it on her desk, and opened it, Inside was small, grapefruit sized gift box, done up with ribbons and a bow, the wrapping paper depicted little Nguyen symbols. What the hell is this Brianna picked up the box, shook it around to a metal clinking noise, and pulled the ribbon off as the team watched expectantly. Perhaps what they weren't expecting was her particular choice of vocalization. Fuck Brianna pulled a bar of aura chalcum out of the box, hefting it in her palm. Our target was getting paid in 250 million new yen's worth of orange alcum. Explained Wildcard. That's your share as part of the team. All 50 million of it, don't spend it all in one place. Chuckled Locke, before coughing harshly into his elbow. Tears welled in Brianna's eyes as she looked between each member of the team, with everyone grinning, except for Wildcard, who was sporting the usual thin, botexed smile. I'm going to miss you guys. We'll keep in touch said Ben, who knows, maybe someday we'll all get back together for one last job, everyone laughed, although no joke had been made and nobody really believed the sentiment, now, if you'll excuse me, said Ben, I've got to get back to Portland, the diplomatic corps needs me on the home front to help with this PR nightmare, I'm off to Detroit, said Dervish, to get a new suit of armor fitted, then Lagos to clean up some wall or to swipe, Rome said wildcard, to begin laying down the groundwork for my grand project, and I'll be teaching in Vienna, said Locke, standing for the first time, until we meet again, said Brianna, producing a bottle of nice vodka from one of her lower desk drawers, everyone lined up their shots, until we meet again, repeated dervish, as all five gulped down their drinks, as the forerunners left the faulty bar, they didn't look back, not at the bar, and not at each other. Each man was confident that his own destiny was merely beginning. 1.30 p.m., the 20th of July, 2074, Quiet Singh, Hong Kong Free Enterprise Zone Specs sat alone in a four-person booth in the corner coffee house. He dragged his finger across the paper in his hands, closing the final page of the America Sand by Weekly Daojin. He briefly considered getting up and asking for a refill of his cooling coffee, but that would be too hard. What if the server pointed out he was only half done what if they thought he didn't like the coffee better to just not talk to anyone. Ever. Sometimes, Specs did have to talk to people. However, like when his teammate Ibu swaggered into the booth and sat next to him. The massive Oni had a face like chipped porcelain, its smooth surface dented by piercings and old scars. Ibu was, as always in full punk party boy get up, and the rest of the coffee house stared at him, specs reddened just by being viewed in proximity. That America san is one hell of a guy, said Ibo, in clipped Cantonese. You catching up, why yes, said specs, making eye contact with the reflection in his coffee. Well, don't bother, the author takes too long to update industriousness is one of the truest virtues how can we trust tales of Vader from a man with no honor Ibu flexed his muscles to emphasize, something, Specs continued to hide in his hoodie as a statuesque Chinese woman and a tiny, harsh featured Filipino dwarf sidled across from him into the booth, I don't like being stared at, grunted widow, then, said Jade, calmly, you probably shouldn't be running with Ibu and I, 
She turned to face Spex. Are you done with your coffee yeah? Said Spex. Standing. I'm done. Shadow run story time end originally I was going to do the epilogue as all separate posts. But holy fuck is it late so here's the cliff's notes so I can go to bed. I may go back and unrewrite all of these another day. Daria St. George and Jet Black's indie record label struck it big, competing with Horizons in house music studio directly Emily Granger married Bend after two years of dating. She remained a frequent Metaplanet tourist and pursued charity work. Julia Green continued her rise to become the premier cyber doc in the Seattle area. Becoming frequently referred to as the one woman crime wave Joseph Green became Dervish's sidekick by mass public appeal. Taking on the identity of Little Texas, Dervish's handler and partner who can't deal with Dervish's over the top shenanigan. He didn't have to do much acting. Jordan Formick became deputy head of the TIG Ghosts, but never accepted the position of head because that would mean he couldn't go on operations anymore since a guest starred on Dervish's TV show for three seasons. Reconciled with his wife Mariella, and then upon learning that he had come down with a terminal heart condition requested to be airdropped into the jungles of the Amazonian front with nothing but a combat knife to see how long he could survive Vulcan was eaten by his own security drop bears. His abandoned bunker is presumably filled with Tilesma, but is something of an urban legend to local runners, as all of its contents are guarded by roving drop bears and obscene arrays of automated weaponry Aiden Remedal of the SIN. Manager was fired for gross incompetence and ended up homeless Dr. Lorcelot finished his residency, changed his entire identity, and refused to serve Halloweeners for the rest of his entire natural lifespan. Hippocratic Oath be damned the Sasquatches continue to hang out on their nature preserve, play video games, and generally be awesome I can't believe Trout kept up with the team's adventures. I wonder how Spex is gonna ruin this milk run. John the Ghoul eventually became head of Taminus which didn't stop him from still showing up to all of Twody's kids' birthday parties. Trigger became a systems management Ari, eventually becoming the custodian to the Ra Seattle node when Twody moved on Ariana the tiny adorable child goblinized into a massive troll upon puberty, but was fitted with the best headwear that daddy could buy. She eventually went to law school and became a meta human rights attorney. Josie had two more natural children by 2D, both orcs and technomancers. Against all odds, she raised them mostly right. Mostly. Joe Trout Sekigahara escaped from a secret Cedar Corp project dedicated to reverse engineering adept powers, whereupon he was picked up by Horizon for a secret project dedicated to brainwashing adepts. After the project was deemed a resounding failure, he was unceremoniously dumped on the streets of Seattle, where he perpetrated a crime spree of petty larceny and senseless violence for six hours before Lone Star recaptured him. Damien Geppetto Sanitieri eventually lead a vicious coup of the Merlins, seizing the Catholic Mafia's pet whiz gang for his own purposes. He used his position of authority to catch the ears of major mob figures, driving them to ever greater acts of cruelty and depravity and causing mob-related crime to become a serious epidemic in the years to come. His more audacious acts lead to extreme public notoriety, making him something of a supervillain. Malcolm Twody McWilliams eventually got promoted to head of Matrix security development for Raz as a whole, and moved to Detroit with his wife and three meat kids. He maintained his cronying friendship with Bradford Nice, then a member of the board of directors. Felix Locke Ramirez was given sanctuary by the corporate court and extradited to Vienna, where he worked in magical R&D developing combat spells. He also taught at the University of Vienna and kept a lasting friendship with the Great Dragon. Schwarzkopf Dylan Wildcard Cadbury founded Eurozone Fixer Network called Condo Theory 15. Referring to the Italian name for a mercenary soldier in the minimum sentence in the United Kingdom for bank robbery, C-15 maintained its own ranks and hierarchy as independent of the existent Eurozone running culture, predominantly focused around financial monitoring and large-scale heists and thefts. His lieutenants, Belfast and Luca, maintained his cover identity as an Italian foreign minister, the better to approach their eventual goal, robbing God. Peter Bend Colby married his girlfriend Emily and joined the TI diplomatic corps as external advisory and troubleshooting. In the years to come, any runner doing business with the TI princes would come to know him by a different title. Johnson. Jonathan Motherfucking Dervish Red Eagle Garrett America Sam Jordan was eventually reunited with his real parents, a lower middle class couple living in Denver. 
The identity that he had come to represent, however, was very different from that which they associated with their son, and so although he came to involve them more in his life, he always felt distant. He maintained a public identity as Ra's chief above board company man, first into the fray in every conflict Ra's fought in his natural lifespan. Alongside him were his trusty camera crew and his sidekick, Little Texas, who earned Dervish's admiration for real when he killed noted arms dealer and international criminal Taka with a motorcycle. When he eventually began aging, as a distinct counterpoint to his elf teammates, or wildcard and 2D, who leonized, he chose to grow old in honor of Sensei, eventually taking on his own students. And that's all she wrote, ladies and gents. If it means the same to you, I'm going to fall the fuck asleep. So I've recently moved Nick Bedia merch over to Teesprings and have a few new designs. Listings are below the video and in the description. Just stop! Just stop it! Stop! No! Just stop it! It's time to stop! It's time to stop, okay? No more! Protective Services. It's time to stop.